It's time for Mac Break Weekly. Renee Ritchie, Andy Anako, and Alex Lindsay are all in studio. We're going to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the iPhone. Some memories from 2007 coming up. Also, Consumer Reports changes its tune. Was it all just some link bait? It's coming up next on Mac Break Weekly. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for MacBreak Weekly is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is MacBreak Weekly, episode 541, recorded Tuesday, January 10th, 2017. The PETA Toaster. MacBreak Weekly is brought to you by Texture. Access the world's most popular magazines anytime, anywhere, using your smartphone or tablet. Try it free for 14 days at texture.com slash twit. And by FreshBooks, the ridiculously easy cloud accounting software that's used by over 10 million small business owners. Try it free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash MacBreak. And by ZipRecruiter. Are you hiring? With ZipRecruiter.com, you can post to 200-plus job boards, including social networks, all with a single click. Screen, rate, and hire the right candidates fast. Try ZipRecruiter free at ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. It's time for Mac Break Weekly, the show where we cover the Mac Break Weekly. Every week we cover the Mac Break. Joining us right now, Alex Lindsay from the Fortress of Lindsay Land. It's, uh, all, we, all we know about it is it's covered in soundproof material. Hello, Isn't Alex. Isn't that the way everyone? You know, it's it's actually I, they they told me it was sound uh, soundproof. With a little bit more research, I found that it was just soft padding. You know, <laughs> they chose not to make it white, so Alex, that I would feel less. Uh, the padding on the wall, it's there yeah, for soundproofing. Uh, that, that's right. that's what they told me. That's soundproofing. They said that we don't want you to be bothered by us. <laughs> Great to have you from the Pixel Core, Alex Lindsay on the Twitter. Also here, here. Andy and Nako of the Chicago Sun Times. Hello, Hello, Andrew. And let's not ask what. What should we not I ask? Gonna, I was no. I was just going to make a, 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 a wise wise ass comment. I think we should prefer. It Do not let me suppress the wise assery. <laughs> I think the wise assery must continue. Fortunately, my wise assery, like a liquid, ex will expand to fill any volume that is contained in. So not, no worries there. <laughs> also, from Imor, he's back. Sinus infection healed? No, oh, I you've apologize got, you've for got, my voice, Leo. Renee Rich. You've got sick guy hair. It's wonderful. You just got a I bit. know. Oh, Renee. No, it's, I actually, I, I took a shower, and because it's, it's a humid cold, uh, this is what happened uh, to me. Oh, the humid cold is the worst, isn't it? It's like minus fifteen or twenty or something, but it's humid, so it's. How do all Canadians not get keep? How do they? How do they not all get sick this time of year? Just all of them. I don't know. Like, and I went to the doctor, and they said, "Well, the good news is that it's viral and it'll last for six weeks." And I said, "That's not good news." And they said, "Well, if we call it good news, it sounds better." <laughs> <laughs> That's bedside manner for you. <laughs> That's hysterical. So I apologize for my voice. Yesterday was a day that will live in infamy. January 9th, 2007. The birth of this little doohickey here. The iPhone. You've got yours. Renee's reaching over to get his. I charged mine up. And uh, what's amazing is it still works. It's still so pretty. Isn't it? It's, it's Andrew? No. Andrew, um, I'm I'm sorry. I thought I I, I was I, I grabbed for another like uh, handheld device with rounded corners and a and a highlighted center button. This one came out two or three years before that. That's, too many buttons. So, too many buttons. They're so easy to. Oh, there you go. That's that's the one. That's, oh sorry. yeah, yeah. There. <laughs> he. All of us have this old phone collection lying around. I was disappointed. I have one somewhere. I don't know. I lost it in a move. It's, it's in some box. There's some yeah. box that I, I didn't want to give it up. I was disappointed neither. <laughs> I mean, I guess we even then we knew it was historic. I was disappointed because I had erased the contents. I was hoping to find, um, you know, pictures from 2008. Two megapixel pictures. Yeah. So we're, I'm trying to remember, Alex. Were you with me in the room when Steve made the announcement? I know Scott Bourne was. I think you were. I, I think, think you were sitting next to me. Yeah, I think I was. Yeah. Yeah. It was you on my left, we Scott Bourne on my right. I don't remember if Merlin was there or not. The original Mac Break team. And Scott, remember Scott Bourne was, had been talking for two years on Mac Break Weekly about <laughs> how he couldn't wait for the iPhone. 
Didn't he throw his trio on the floor and stomp on it as soon as it was announced yes. and then find out it was six months away? Yes, I think he did. Uh, <laughs> let me get, let me get the uh, Steve Jobs iPhone announcement up here for you. What a great! I rewatched it again yesterday. Just what a what an artist at the height of his powers. This I think absolutely Steve at his absolute uh, best. I'm not sure which will be. Well, it's, it's chief. It's chiefly just. Here we go. James Brown. James Brown. Good God. Skip ahead a little bit to about a minute in on this. This is him just coming out on the stage. He. This is during Macworld Expo, so he's at the Moscone West, the giant auditorium there. Throw in with us as 2006. I think it's, one, it's one minute in, a little bit back. There'll be a glowing apple. Oh, actually, no, more than one minute in on this. There'll be you. You were there. Go backwards. No, way back. You're you're way far ahead. I, I don't know. Maybe not. Uh, oh, they're still using you know what, the same keynote template. You go to yeah. in seven months, but we didn't do this alone. Okay, so <laughs> I'm sorry. I thought you had a cue. We did this with lots and lots of lawyers. Mm. Lots of lawyers. Lots and lots of lawyers. So pause for refreshment while I yeah, I put up. the link in the show notes. The other yeah. direct one. Yeah. Thank you. Very bad. There we go. What I was going to say is that the, the real thing is like you could see that he has been dying to give this keynote for a year and a half, two years, and he's just excited as anything just to finally yeah. be able to show this thing off. But there's a backstory because we also know that this was a very unlikely to succeed demo. And the engineers were all sitting in the front rows with a bottle of liquor. And each time the engineer responsor for, for any responsible for any part of the demos section passed successfully. Take a shot. And they ended up and drunk. <laughs> Anything involving a radio was <laughs> yeah. not good. There were only a few, a handful of working iPhones. He, there was, he had two on stage in case the first one failed. And there was one exact and only path that Steve could yep. take through the demo that would work. <laughs> Anything else would guarantee to crash it. Here, let's watch. Because when you know that, Steve's presence and... Uh, centeredness is remarkable given the risky terrain he's about to enter. Well, he, he knows he's not going to get fired. <laughs> Every once in a while, a revolutionary product comes along that changes everything. And Apple has been, well, first of all, one's very fortunate if you get to work on just one of these in your career. Apple's been very fortunate. It's been able to introduce a few of these into the world. 1984, we introduced the Macintosh. It didn't just change Apple. I skip ahead. Just it changed the bit. whole computer industry. Although it's it's coming up pretty quick. I'll, I'll let I'll let him continue through. It's fun to fun to watch this. A, a master in his prime. He's I, he's not ill at this point, right? He's very. 2001. Thin. Yeah. We introduced the first iPod. And it didn't just it didn't just change the way we all listen to music. It changed the entire music industry. Yeah, no, I think he looks healthy here. Well, today we're introducing three revolutionary products of this class. The first one is a widescreen iPod with touch controls. Now, let me pause for a moment and the ask you, uh, you, Renee, you weren't in the audience. You were probably 12 no. years old when this happened. <laughs> no, it was right before I started, like uh, two months before I started working at iMore. Andy, happened. you must have been though, right? You were going to yeah, back. I was there. Yeah. yeah. So uh, I'll, uh, Alex and Andy, uh, we we all thought there was going to be an iPhone, right? But there wasn't, but no confirmation. Of course, this is back when Apple really had the lid on things. So there was no sneaky rumor, right? Well, and I think, I think uh -huh. I, I had this feeling when that, when this part happened, I was like, oh no, we're not going to get the phone. You know, like he was talking about an iPad, iPod. I was like, iPod, you know. Widescreen so iPod, it was, right. It was a great, it was an incredible buildup. In fact, the, the, the applause at that point is a little lukewarm. Yeah, they're like, What? We, we we thought well, there, there would be a phone at this announcement, though, right, Andy? I mean, we we're pretty sure there was. Yeah, that was that was pretty much a lock. But they had a really good uh, leash down on what the yeah. details of that device would be, and I don't think anybody was expecting anything like the iPhone. They were expect, certainly expecting something much better than you know <laughs> than something that looked like this, say. 
Uh, but no one had the had the forethought to say, no, it's going to be an all touch screen thing. There's going to be only one mechanical button. Uh, so yeah. there's a, an immense amount of excitement because every but it's not that, oh, well, maybe we'll finally get an update to the iMac this year or maybe we'll get, you know, this is the one where we'll get the touch bar on the new MacBook. It's going to be there's going to be a brand new product that we have absolutely never seen before. And nobody knows exactly what form it's going to take. There was an immense amount of excitement. I think we thought uh, that I do. And I think Scott yeah. Bourne, as I remember, was saying. He called it the IFA, but nobody knew even what the name was going to be. That just seemed like, yeah. you know, that was a, a, yeah. a placeholder. So I'll, I'll skip back just a, a second so you can hear the applause when he says. The first one is a widescreen iPod with touch controls. Well, there's, there's some good cheering there, but I don't know. This is, this is when video was brand new on the iPod. So right. That, okay. The second is a revolutionary mobile phone. That's the cheering. Because now that confirms what we'd suspected. There's a phone. But we're still puzzled. Go ahead, Renee. If you think about it for a second, that very first slide took Apple's most successful, most profitable uh, product of the day and deprecated it to an app in one sentence. Isn't that amazing? That's a good point. Isn't that amazing? And the third is a breakthrough internet communications device. People a little more puzzled at yeah. this point. Like, okay. huh? Um, look at that now. Okay. Yeah. Now, by the way, Renee, no one knew at the time whether this was going to be a success or not. I mean, no. we yeah. Apple fans, we were all very excited and wanted it, but but there was... Even Apple didn't know how big a success it was People going People thought it wouldn't be, be an well, excess. And, one phone and, on and, one and, network for $600? Right. Well, we didn't well, know and, that and, yet. And the phone companies were telling us how complicated it was. Go ahead. The phone companies were like, I, you know, all the phone companies that make phones, they go, I don't think that Apple understands how complicated making <laughs> phones is. You know, well, you know, they're going to they're going to learn. Yeah, I thought that I thought, why would Apple want to get in this ho awful, horrific business? So three things, a widescreen iPod with touch controls, a revolutionary mobile phone and a breakthrough Internet communications device. An iPod, a phone, <laughs> and an internet communicator. An iPod. iPod. <laughs> oh, phone. oh, now we start. Now it's. Oh. Are you getting it? <laughs> These are not three separate devices. This is one device. And we are calling it iPhone. And that Today, was it. That was it, man. I, I'll never forget that moment. Uh, yeah. And I'm sure Scott Bourne was at that point jumped, had leapt to his feet. <laughs> Harry McCracken was retweeting some of the live tweets from Macworld yesterday. Oh, like, fun. Like, you know, 3,000 or 6,000 day old tweets. It's like, doesn't Cisco own the iPhone trademark? What is Apple doing? Right. This is interesting, but there's no way people will buy it. Right. I read a comment thread on, uh, uh, I can't remember, was it 9 to 5 or Mac Rumors, where half the people were just saying, this is ridiculous, I would never buy this. Yeah. There was not a lock by any means. I mean, Apple fans were really yeah. excited, but it was not a lock. What we also, also didn't we know is that what he's going to tell us, which is, you're right, Andy, $650 and six months from now. Yeah, we should we should be we should be a little patient with all these people who back in the day were skeptical because we're not just talking about in an era where the phone is free with a contract, pay it, give us six hundred fifty dollars, but also no, it doesn't work with Microsoft Exchange. No, it doesn't have it. Won't, it doesn't have cut and paste. No, it doesn't have apps. No, it doesn't have. You go through the list of everything no, that PG, made no, like yes. Everything that made like a phone like this super super popular. Everything that made the Blackberries super super popular and important. Nope, not, well, not, let's on, watch, not on this device. Let's watch so. that part of it here. Mobile device. But well, what we're going to do is get rid of all these buttons and just make a giant screen. This is the first a picture giant I think, of, any, of the iPhone anybody saw. Now, how are we going to communicate this? We don't want to carry around a mouse, right? So what are we going to do? Oh, a stylus, right? We're going to use a stylus. No. <laughs> <laughs> no. Who wants no. a stylus? No. You have to get them and put them away, and you lose them. Yuck. Nobody wants a stylus. Uh, so let's not use a 
Uh, for a few more years anyway. Stylus. <laughs> What's funny is that that We're was gonna... the absolute biggest screen they could do at that point. It was 3.5 was the limits of okay. technology and density when they made that. This is an iPhone. Yeah. I, can, I don't know if we have a tight shot, but this is the iPhone and this is the iPhone 7, you know, 10 years later. It looks Big. like the iPhones. Yeah. <laughs> it's like three and a half inches. birth to it. Yeah. 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 Well, and that's the other thing. And I, uh, this, this was harder to do than you really can imagine because none of this stuff had been created in mass quantities before. The digitizer, so the screen, yep. the radio, all of this stuff, Apple had to invent. And now here we are 10 years later. Thank you, Apple, because... This stuff is easy and cheap, and that's why we have drones. That's why we have self-driving cars. A hundred products that come from the fact that this sold a billion copies and, and well, the manufacturer and you, was streamlined. And if you back up, you know, this wouldn't have been possible without the iPod, without Apple being able to reinvent itself and be able to, to create a whole other business model that was that gave them the money to do that R&D, to give them the money to have the market to be able to, to dive into that. So it's, it's very much of a... Um, you know, a, you know, one thing after the other, where it's, if you look back on, I mean, Apple have been playing with this idea of touchscreens and, and, and all the things that we see in, in an iPod for, a, you know, decades. Um, but they, you know, just couldn't quite get their head around it. And they finally had the money and, and the time to, to work it out. Which, and, and interestingly enough, I guess the iPhone was first because they couldn't make the screens bigger, <laughs> you know, because the they iPad was, make the iPad, was really right. their thing. Yeah, and they were they were so uncertain that the iPhone would ship that they originally had two two branches. They had P1 that Tony Fidel was running. That was essentially the iPod phone. Uh, that was much simpler. And then they had P2, and these are both part of the the Purple Experience project at Apple. P2, which was the one uh, that Scott Forstall and everybody was running, which was the attempt to put OS 10 and multi-touch and everything onto a phone. And thankfully, that there was some debate about whether they'd have to ship P1 before P2 because it just might not be ready in time. But P2 actually blew past it. It did things like SMS first, uh, and they were able to get the iPhone out. It would be a very different world, I think, if, a, if an iPod phone had shipped. Sonny Dixon uh, earlier this week leaked these photos of a, a prototype interface, including a click wheel of all things. Yeah, that's things. P1. That's P1. Yeah. Uh, and, and it made sense because you have this great successful product, the iPod. Maybe you just uh, use the same UI as the iPod. I, you know, and it would have been looking back on. It, I think it would have been funky. Like you would have been like, well, oh, absolutely! You know, you know, Thank God, you know, this it would failed. have been a really weird, yeah, weird interface. Why the acorn? I've been wondering in this demo video, that an acorn pops up first as they boot it up. They just have like there's Alpine was on the. Oh, that was just a code name. Alpine. Okay, yeah. this is obviously a, a clandestine video of the uh, interface, probably shot at the time. I don't know. Um, but yeah, this this looks like an iPod. And the funny thing is, Steve, in his presentation, if we jump back a little bit, tricks everybody after he announces the iPhone by showing a uh, a click yeah. wheel based. That was the rumor, right? At the time. Oh, yeah, that yeah. It actually, puts a big phone <laughs> dial on it. That's great. And then that actually been fun. Master Showman, watch. I love this. Watch this. So he does no. this. Actually, here it is, but we're going to leave it there for now. Oh, he takes it out of his pocket and Such a tease. puts it back in. Master Showman. So he's explaining the UI, you know, and this is a unique UI. It's far more accurate than any touch display that's ever been shipped. It, works it ignores like magic, unintended touches. It it's screen. super smart. You can do multi-finger gestures on it. And boy, have we patented it. So... <laughs> Why did he Microsoft say that? Lawsuit. Why do you think because that the Microsoft lawsuits over the Macintosh and Windows of the okay. day? Okay. It, it, that's a very Steve thing too, isn't it? He was very I mean that when you look back, we are all the sum of our damage. And when you look also, back at how personally he took yeah. losing out the PC interface to Microsoft yeah. and then how he went after Android, like that that was all very personal to yeah. him. But but also a lot of people were chasing after this. So it was really, really important to make sure that he that that whatever research they had done originally that they could actually lock down for. It's not as though this kind of sprung full. They they they, they were certainly there years before anybody else could have possibly delivered it. But like the Mac interface, there were a lot of people who thought this would be a good idea for some sort of a tablet device. The, there was a really in, incredibly insane like. Uh, a uh, scholastic uh, multi-touch demo with sort of a tabletop sort of thing showing how we can manipulate documents. And it wasn't like the, the greatest demo of all time. No, but I 60s, remember seeing it. But it was, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. So there was so there were a lot of people who were chasing this. And so you need to make sure that establish that. No, 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 no. We we own this. You're not going to say, aha, thank you for we, we now we will now use the Apple's fast forward and build something, buy one of these, take it apart and build something right. just like it. But Apple did not invent multi-touch. It was invented at Carnegie Mellon. There was a very famous demo of multi-touch a couple of years before this yeah. came out. They bought Fingerworks, yeah. which gave yeah. them a big jump start. Do this. Well, we start with a strong foundation. iPhone runs OS X. Yeah. Now, that's an interesting thing. <laughs> does it? <laughs> it does. Well, it was kind of like Tony's was Linux. So like, like the oh, P1 was Linux, but P2 was, yeah. Uh, it it does. I, I asked that question directly just after the keynote during my briefing. I said, "Yep, it is OS 10 with everything removed from it that is not required for uh, that's not required for use as a phone." What was hilarious is that the original Apple TV, the code name was Lobot because it was lobotomized uh, OS 10 <laughs> Tiger, and that actually gave them the confidence that they could reduce down what was OS 10 to a much smaller device. He was also actually the, the, the slide just before that though that was actually kind of prophetic because we're five five years ahead of any other phone and it really did take until 2012 years, before yeah. Android even started to, and the hardware yeah. started to get its act together and you could say that it was only last year that they really started making things that were uh, competitive functionally with an iPhone. He did that and unfortunately. They started. Then they started catching fire. They were so far ahead. <laughs> <laughs> he did. I think Steve really understood, though. Here's what a revolution is about to. We've been very lucky to have brought a few revolutionary user interfaces to the market in our time. First was the mouse. The second was the click wheel, and now we're going to bring multi-touch to the market. And each of these revolutionary user interfaces has made possible a revolutionary product, the Mac, the iPod, and now the iPhone. He's kind of revisionist. I mean, well, no, he didn't. He didn't say they invented it. He said yeah. they brought it to market. Like well, it very, Microsoft very, brought it to market carefully. a little yeah. earlier, but that's okay. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's fair. That's fair. Uh, they certainly made it, as with everything Apple does, they made it a, 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 an existing product. A couple of things I forgot about the uh, original iPhone. It's per inch. Patrick Delahanty, who still has his. Uh, pointed this this highest out. we've ever shipped 160 ppi it's highest gorgeous <laughs> and on the front there's only one button down there we call it the home button it takes you home from wherever you are still there and that's it yeah let's take a look at the side not only that but the the image on the home button is the outline of an app really nice subtle little touch oh wait a minute i didn't notice that that's a good point it's a little squircle it, yeah yeah of, a, of an app icon yeah it's kind it's of thick really compared thin. to today's. It's thinner than any <laughs> smartphone out there at 11.6 millimeters. Thinner than the Q, thinner than the Blackjack, thinner than all of them. The what? The Q? The Blackjack? It's really nice. Who remembers the and Q and the Blackjack? And we've got some controls on the side. I remember, yeah, I remember the Blackjack. Jerry. Silent. We've got a <laughs> well, I know. You and I do because that's our business. But yeah. Let's look at the back. Look at Windows the size of that camera. First thing of note is we got a two megapixel camera built Ooh. right in. Ooh. Our it's selfie cam is bigger than that now. <laughs> no, it was good for yeah. the time. Yeah, I mean, before, this is a, before it was six six forty by four eighty camera was a big deal. Right, all this you is, did, you only took you only took pictures to here is here is here's what happened in the car crash and right. sent to your insurance company. It's not for actually right. taking pictures. The other side, and we're back on the front. So let's take a look at the top now. We've got a headphone jack, a headset jack. That By the you way, use your standard headphones with so <laughs> deeply inset because the metal's so thick. Yes, you have to have. Well, listen to what he says. He doesn't say your headsets. He says your iPod headsets. Uh -huh. Three and a half millimeter. All your iPod headphones fit right in. Aha. Uh -huh. yeah. We've got a place, a little tray for your SIM card, and we've got one switch for sleep and wake. Just push it to go to sleep. Push it to wake up. Let's take a look at the bottom. We've got a speaker. We got a microphone. And we've got our 30-pin iPod connector. So that's the bottom. Now, we've also got some stuff you can't see. We've got three really advanced sensors built into this phone. The first one is a proximity sensor. So uh, we don't have to go too, too deep into this. Okay. Uh, the demo is interesting because now we know. Flow. First time ever on an iPod. Now we so know. So rather than talk about this some more, let me show it to you. How risky this was at this point. All the engineers <laughs> are not in cloth seats, so they can easily be wiped Alrighty. down. <laughs> now, I've got some special 
<laughs> special <laughs> iPhones up here. They've got a little special board it's in them. And just a, like the checklist that like Apollo astronauts had. Yeah, on the you moon. saw that. Yeah, you will do. Yes. You will do this in exactly, exactly. this order yes. in the golden exactly cloud. this yes. time. And it's well, laminated in case of a sudden projectile. But like remembering back, like I had a trio that would crash when it made phone calls, when it took phone calls, when it launched apps, <laughs> and he shows going from music to answering the phone to right. email to right. web to back. And like we all make fun of the iPhone for the lack of third-party multitasking, but that was one of the most impressive mobile multitasking demos I'd ever seen at the time. Yeah, yeah. He had, I can't remember how many he had. I think there were only one or two, right? There was two on, so I think, on this some podium. digital video out, and I got a little cord here which goes up to these projectors. I remember Alex at the time was going, how do I get that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> how do I get video time. out of this? We were like, I want the cord. <laughs> well, forget, the, forget the bone, I need the cord. And uh, you know, so I got want. some great images, yeah. and you get to see what it really looks like. So let me, I've got a camera here so you can see what I'm doing with my finger for a few seconds. And uh, let me go ahead and get that picture within picture up. I'm going to go ahead and just push the sleep-wake button. And there we go, right there. Singular. And to unlock the phone, I just take my finger and slide Nemo. it across. It says singular. Wow. Yep. No, because that was... You also forget that the only reason why... One of the reasons why this was such a breakthrough product was that every other mobile carrier was able to tell mobile phone, here is the here is the product yeah. we're willing to buy from you put in our stores. Also, here are the limits that we are going to put on you because our network cannot handle the web, so you're not going to put right. a full bore web, uh, web browser. AT&T had just... They started off as AT&T Wireless, and then they became Singular, and then they switched back to AT&T again. They were not really a big carrier, and and they picked that they got exclusivity on the iPhone chiefly because they're not the first company that Apple approached. They're the first company that said, yes, please, by all means, give us a hot product that will put us on the map and get us subscribers. So well, that's just, yes, we will Verizon, give you a web browser. Yes. Verizon laughed them right out, didn't they? I mean, yeah, yes. they turned yeah. them down. Yeah. yeah. Oops. Right. Oops, I jumped back. Wi-Fi, 802.11n, and the latest Bluetooth 2.1. Wow, that's a weird Wait, image. This is, and the, the usual this is wrong. This is the iPad. Somehow yeah, that's the I, iPad. Yeah, somehow I got... To say. Anyway, enough of, we, enough of that. Somehow I got to a, a different uh, presentation. Well, what a... I mean, 10 years ago. It's amazing. What a 10 years have, have done. That product has just been... Uh, I don't think there's a bigger tech product in history. What I realized is that the Macintosh was what? It was it's 1998, so it was like seven eight years old at that point and now it's 10 years since iphone so it's longer since introduction of the iphone than it was between Wait. iphone and imac imac came out in 80, 80 oh, 98 the imac yeah yeah, yeah 98 yeah yeah, yeah 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 wow so nine yeah nine yeah. years and then 10 years now oh we're all getting old let's take a <laughs> break there's some big changes coming to apple uh we'll talk about that some uh some interesting stories from robert scoble we'll talk about that and consumer <laughs> reports backtracks We'll talk about that, but first, a word from our sponsor, Texture. Love. Texture was the, the what the iPhone and iPad were invented. Well, I saw somebody tweet that just the other day. This is what I this is this the app for the iPad. What is Texture? It's like Netflix for magazines. Some of your favorite magazines, all of them, hundreds of them, available with one low monthly subscription fee. Rolling Stone, Esquire, National Geographic. And they're all in the app, all on your iPad. It's easy to search for a specific article. There's curation. So even if you don't know a magazine, but there's a great article in it, you'll find it. And I mean, this is so much less expensive and frankly, so much more sensible than subscribing to 200 magazines or buying them on the newsstand. It's also fun to get, there's magazines in there that you might not actually uh, think about getting or subscribing, but it's great to, to read. Like I, for me, ad, it's Ad Week and Billboard and, you know, stuff professionally. But I also, there's always an article in The Atlantic I want to read every month, uh, National Geographic. Incidentally, photos look better on your iPad screen than they do in the print. Of course they do. So this is a better way to consume photography magazines and magazines like National Geographic. I just, I love it. Every page of the current newsstand issue, plus back issues, plus bonus features that don't work in print, like video. Uh, it's now normally it's nine ninety nine a month, which is amazing, really, if you think about it. That's two. That's buying two magazines on the newsstand. There's, but there's always, you know, the New Yorker, Wired, Dwell, one of my favorite housing magazines. We were talking about that yesterday on iOS Today. I love Dwell. Love to look at those great houses. I'm very happy with this, and I know you will be too. Right now, you get a 14-day free trial if you go to Texture, 
T-E-X-T-U-R-E dot com slash twit so you can see what it would be like. And by the way, I love this. You can have up to five devices. So we share. We, ha you know, we have our family subscription. You can pre-download. You know, I favorite the magazines I want to read all the time. And I can have them automatically downloaded so that when I get on the plane, even if I forget ahead of time, I've got them. Texture.com slash twit. Texture.com slash twit. Why? Why buy paper magazines? Why have all that clutter? Why have all the expense when you can read it right there on your iPad? There's always something good to read if you've got texture. Uh, it's Mac Break Weekly time. We've got Renee Ritchie, Alex Lindsay, Andy Inakko. Andy, have you, do you decided yet if you're going to come out for a Sal's dinner uh, at the end of the month? Uh, I'm trying. I'm going to see if I can use my air miles to come out. Uh, so that that's going to that's that going to mean that I might have. To, that would be super fun. It'd be super fun. So I guess. Who's who's putting this on? I think it's Paul Kent who's like, That's who leading it is. the charge. Mac, yeah. former Mac World Expo guy, uh, and uh, I presume Sal and Naomi will be there. <laughs> One can only <laughs> well, hope. I hope so. I'm, I, I I didn't pay for my two hundred fifty dollar ticket, you know, without the without the the, the celebrity speaker uh, actually appearing. <laughs> uh, it's I think it's just really neat. Um, a tribute to uh, the great Sal Segoyan. Um, Dinner, uh, I don't, is it open to the public? I don't know. I guess not because. I don't, I don't think so. There's no way you could do that, could you? You should do another one where it is open to the public. You'd have to rent. <laughs> uh, you know, a celebrity roast. Moscone West. Party. Yeah. No, a big party. Yeah. <laughs> Sal party. A Sal party. I think we it's should, nice. we, we should We should counter oh, program the next, like. The, the the next the next big like Apple presentation will just counter program with a with a Sal tribute. I like that. <laughs> Uh, I, w I, I, I tell you what, I will be there if you'll be there. So I don't, uh, I'm going to wait and hear from you. And then uh, if you're going okay. there, I got to go too. Got to go. And Alex, you should probably too, since I'm in uh, Southeast Asia. Of course Otherwise, you're not uh, home. Of I would absolutely be there. I was, no, I, until yesterday, I thought I was going to be able to make it. And um, so I, I was getting all the planning done. And then oh, I, I, uh, I need to be in Southeast Asia. So, so uh, not the only person leaving. Uh, news came out this morning, broke this morning. I didn't even know when I sat down, and uh, Renee told me that Chris Latner is leaving. Who's Chris Latner, Renee? Oh, hold on. We, we don't have any audio out of it. Oh, sorry, Chris Latner is head of developer tools at Apple. Uh, he's famous for doing uh, everything from LLVM to Clang, the, basically the modern compilers that everybody used to make apps on Mac and uh, Well, and LLVM is not just iOS. LLVM is used no, it's, everywhere. It's, it's every Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, at Apple, most recently, he's famous for taking the stage at WWDC a couple of years ago and introducing Swift, the new programming language uh, that Apple is intending to use going forward. So to say that he's had an impact uh, in developer tools in general and Apple specifically is huge understatement. Xcode, which he was responsible for, compiles yep. to LLVM, which stands for Low Level uh, Virtual Machine. Virtual Machine, and it's a virtualization environment. How, I'm, do you know the technical details of LLVM? I did at some point, but basically, it, it, I believe it's an abstraction where it allows it to do a lot of optimization regardless of, of the specific target that you're aiming it at, which right. lets you be more uh, flexible with your development. Latner started it uh, when he was in school at the uh, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign uh, in 2000. And um, uh, it was originally a research infrastructure, according to Wikipedia, then released with the open source license. And that got him a job five years later at Apple in 2005. Yeah. He's been there ever since. Posted on the Swift mailing list uh, that he is leaving. Posted it uh, this morning at 11 uh, a.m. Uh, Central Time. Ted Kremenek will be taking over his project leave. And, and Latner says he will continue to be on the team uh, for Swift. He's completely committed to Swift. I plan to remain an active member of the Swift core team as well as a contributor to the Swift Evolution mailing list, which this yeah, is. It's open source now, so he can do that. I mean, it's not just right. an Apple project anymore. Right. Doesn't say where he's going. Uh, no. He he says merely, uh, I'm, I'm leaving Apple later this month to pursue an opportunity in, in another space. But, t you know, 10 or 11 years at a company is a long time for anybody. Uh, he's a young guy, uh, and I think it makes sense. And it sounds like he's not going to be uh, taking off uh, and, and not contributing back to Swift. So who knows? Somebody may be creating a big Swift thing. 
Well, I mean, to say that he doesn't, that he's not important to Apple is like saying, you know, uh, Steve Jobs wasn't important. Obviously, the world, like Apple, would be very different if if some a lot of these high profile people weren't there. But also, Apple's composed of a lot of incredibly talented people, and he's left Swift and and developer tools Absolutely. in really capable hands. Yeah. So yeah, so nothing to, nothing to worry about there. No, but it is it is again, it's a legend, a legend of our time. Uh, uh, moving on. Yeah, one of the great programmers. So it is surprising, you know, that he's that he's leaving. Well, maybe, uh, maybe not so. So it's sometimes people uh, people who are really, really intelligent, really who really operate at a very, very high level. They, they, I know a lot of these people that they just don't like to stay in one place for that long. They yeah, really get a cheap Yeah, yeah. So I mean, even I, I, this is this is why I even wonder if Johnny Ive is terribly excited about not being able to design toasters, not being able to design. You know, I think one of the reasons why his role has expanded was because. Tell you what, why don't you? We will let you design buildings now. We will let you design all kinds of other things, uh, because it must. It, it might be for some people kind of frustrating to be at that same job, even at such a high level for so long. He sh they should let him do toasters. I would love an <laughs> apple toaster. I'd love to see one. <laughs> I would love of course, to buy. Of one. course, it would, only, it would only be able to, to toast pita bread because it would be <laughs> so thin. But still, It'd be impossibly thin. You'd have to. In fact, you'd have to read. It, it, but it would redefine how uh, bread is processed and how the it's cut. First Melba you know, toaster. It's, and then, but it's going to be less calories because, you know, it, they're going to cut all the bread will be a little denser. And, and you know, I'm, I'm sure that the manufacturers would would first say this is crazy, but a couple of them would get ahead of it. Next thing we know, all of our toast is like that that thin Pepperidge farm, you know, kind of. Yeah. He could go to work for a Dyson. I just saw my I went, got my hair cut a couple of days ago and the hairdresser had a four hundred dollar brand new Dyson uh, blower hair blower. That's just like this. It's just like it looks like it's something out of another dimension. It's just a hole, <laughs> and the hot air comes out of. There's no. There's no back to it. There's no. It's of course Dyson. They do some weird stuff, but um, it was pretty cool looking. <laughs> they need to do that with the Floby so that it just it's just like this thing sucks your hair in. Like a molar, but there's, there's just like a there's like a space there with with blades and it goes <laughs> it just it just like just sucks the air the the hair right out. That would be. I'm sorry. I <laughs> Here, man. This is, this is what man. the... This is, I don't know why how I got into this, but it's it's kind of cool. This is what it looks like. It's just a... The hot air comes it's somehow like magically out of that hole. <laughs> it's, and you can all see they, through it. It's like magic. They bring the air in through the bottom and then and then uh, project it. Uh, oh. It's project... It's, it's air projection. Yeah. Yeah. It's pretty cool. High voltage through... Uh, through compressed uh, outputs yeah i mean you know air sort of ways so high compression through compressed yeah. output yeah I, th that's a that's a, a some really interesting uh um, industrial design maybe johnny could go there they if they <laughs> if they made a toaster like that i'd be <laughs> imagine a toaster fridge <laughs> go on you had me at so fridge an internet toaster fridge robert scoble has an interesting story uh on facebook don't know it's from CES. There is not a lot of Mac news at CES. In fact, some people said it's kind of odd that Apple, which has in the past without being at CES, has dominated CES, dominated the mindset, because, of course, 2007, they announced the iPhone. During CES, they announced the iPad in 2010. During CES, it's all anybody can talk about. 2015, Mark Gurman leaked the MacBook during CES. <laughs> really? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, oh, the Mac, the little thin one, yeah. Yeah. This year, nobody's talking really, except Robert's got a, quite a scoop. He was talking to a Zeiss employee. You know, Zeiss makes those lenses, and licenses the name to Sony and others. In fact, I think, I'm trying to think, is Sony an owner of Zeiss or just a big, uh, I think they have a big stake in Zeiss. Anyway, Ze a Zeiss employee confirmed the rumors that Apple, according to Robert Scoble, and Carl Zeiss AG are working on a light pair of augmented reality, mixed reality glasses that may be announced this year. I thought it would be next year, says Scoble, but now I saw that this, now I saw this, I believe it will happen this year. What's interesting that might kind of confirm this is that Zeiss's booth was in the augmented reality pavilion, but they had nothing to show. It just was well, there. Except for a meeting room. They had a meeting room. Everyone went there and, oh, let's go and have, have a meeting. Let's talk to them. And uh, Scoble said, uh, Scoble said around the employees, you're not showing any mixed reality optics. Why not? And he said, Tim Cook didn't let you, and the employees around me smiled nervously. Maybe they just trying, thought he was going to. I was trying to figure out what the news was. And I, I, I don't mean that as a, as a 
question mark. I mean that I was expecting him to say, well, I talked to a source who confirmed for me. He made a joke and got like a weak smile, which I have often received when I make a joke I know. that's not really understood or they're being <laughs> polite. Or, <laughs> or maybe like, they're afraid he'll take like, off his clothes. I don't know. Yeah. yeah, I mean, there 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 are ways you can sort of weasel. If uh, there, it's rare. Once or twice, I have been in a position where I feel like I really have to know if X is true or Y is true. And if you're really, really clever and you have an opportunity, you might be able to like super this password. <laughs> where you go, I'll, I'll ask them a series of questions other than the one question that's direct and get one fifth of the answer with each of these five questions and piece it together. But I didn't, I was reading this, I was just reading this article and I didn't see anything other than I made a joke and I got a nervous laugh in response and I don't know oh, what that means. Oh, anything. so you're taking, okay, so maybe I misread it because I'm taking I'm that he that, got confirmation from a Zeiss employee that they're working with Apple. Do you think that the, the the nervous smiles were the confirmation? No, I think he got separate confirmation. I was well. I was, I'm saying that I was reading. All I'm saying is I was reading this that Facebook post and I didn't understand the nature of right. the confirmation. I think he, I, I I don't know if he amended it or expanded it later on, but all I I didn't see. I talked to someone from Zeiss and Zeiss confirmed this for me. I saw. Ah, I made it. So joke there's a subsequent post there's... which I'm showing. I don't know if you can see it okay. on the screen. There's a subsequent post that no, does refer to the post you saw. That he says a Zeiss employee confirmed the rumors. Got it. Well, so. and, and I think that, I think we should remember that, that the Zeiss market cap is about three billion dollars, which is like a rounding error for Apple. If if the Apple if if they really were getting close to something that was, uh, which could be happening, you know that that you know Apple could write a check yes. and absorb Zeiss yeah. fairly quickly, yeah. probably even a foreign Wait, check. I think it's <laughs> I think it's now accepted wisdom that Apple's next one of Apple's next things is AR, right? I mean, Tim Cook said I mean, it like, several times. The interesting thing is that Scoble is incredibly interested in this. And for him, everything is going to be a, ze right. a zebra. Zebra right. in Canada, a zebra in the right. US, I think. You say so he's going zebra? To look at zebra, Zed, zebra. Yeah, those kind of, I, I don't know. Anyway, so <laughs> everything he sees is going to be a zebra here. Okay. Uh, so, uh, so, so that you have to take that into account. I mean, last year in October, he had a story about the next iPhone being uh, see-through and going into a VR helmet so that you could watch super high quality. You know, and that that's probably not on Apple's roadmap for this year. It's not. It, yeah. They may be exploring that technology, but you know, they're exploring a ton of technology. Tim Cook's made it it's super also, clear that Apple's really interested in AR, but AR uh, AR is sort of like a display. Everything we have now from Apple has an LCD or an LED or or OLED display in it. Uh, but it's not a device that's designed to be that display. And I think we will see some prototypes from Apple, whether they ship or not, I don't know. But eventually AR is going to be a display layer that's going to manifest in a ton of products that Apple makes. Well, and, 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 yeah, and, also, and also I think one of the things that's really hard for people to do, and I think we've talked about it a little bit before, is, is, the, is, is the match moving of pixel data, which is going to make a huge difference. Right now we're really basing everything on uh, a very rough um, approximation of the position of the camera. So that's why our... Our Pokemon Go float, you know, little characters float over the bot is because we're not actually tracking. We're not saying, okay, we know 90% of this from the, the camera position. But what we want to do is look at all those pixels and make sure that whatever I place out there in that space um, can, will stick in, in 3D. And part of that actually is driven from the two the, the two lenses that are the, you know, the two sensors now that the iPhone 7 Plus has makes that that calcul much of that calculation much easier and then you have 2d uh tracking data which which then solves some of those other issues so if you look at that camera is now able to give some rough rudimentary uh 3d data back to the back to the uh, camera so while we're happy with the portrait mode um there is other things that that, that camera those cameras can provide back to the to the uh, camera right now anybody who wants to do that has to write that from scratch you have to, they have to take okay, i'm gonna take all that data and i'm gonna figure it all out um what i think we're gonna see you know sometime soon is apple providing uh, the, the first step for apple to go into ar in my opinion would be for them to write um you know libraries that are going to make that process easy for developers so the developers aren't having to write that from scratch it's like here's our cameras here's the data that it's grabbing here's the match moving data so if i want something to stick i'm just going to say you know make sticky you know you know like not but not like i have to write all of this code and i have to go back to m you know go back and read you know uh you know 10 years of seagraph to figure out how to how to make that work and so i think that that's going to be and and i really believe that that'll be the first step that changes changes a lot of things because no one's doing that that tracking is still something that is you know all that and anytime you see it floating what they're not being able to do is 
is basically derive the 3D information um, uh, and derive uh, 2D tracking information um, that's required. Yeah. Also, we have to remember that uh, AR can also be just a software solution. I think I, uh, when I see what Apple yeah. could do and their their opportunities, I don't see them having a headset. I see them having a, a set of APIs and also augmenting their own internal uh, their their own in-house apps, so that now Apple Maps, you hold it up and you just want to know where is the building I'm trying to find, and it will just simply put right here, dummy. Or uh, in, in five years' time, again, not necessarily you're wearing a pair of glasses, but you want to know where are like where are the power lines or the the the, the, the power the, the weight bearing walls of my house? Where are the power lines? Where are the sewage lines? And be able to simply walk through your house, and because it gave you gave it access to like your architectural data, it will simply like give you X-ray vision through your walls. So you know that I probably should not t take my saws all to that part of the wall because I'm going to have white i'm gonna have gray water all over all over the master bedroom um and uh, but as to uh zeiss i don't think that they'll be that uh, they're a good acquisition target because they're not they're not uh, they're not a, like a company that does has developed a multi-touch technology that they can buy and then integrate they are everything that involves optics and vision so it's camera lenses it's uh, microscope lenses it's medical technology it's manufacturing technology because so many of these automated systems they need to be able to see carefully where is that where is the hole that the screw needs to go into their portfolio is just huge 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 and if apple were to acquire that they would now either have to run that entire business or tell 80 percent of zeiss's customers well good luck on that uh arthroscopic uh site that you're that we're about to sell you but we're not going to sell you anymore I'm, you know, you know what? The Civil War. They did not have any good lenses, and people seem to live. That's okay. So I don't think that. I don't think that's going to happen. But I, I, I really like to see what they what they can do just with software, and I think that that's an area where Apple can really, really excel. Renee Ritchie in the Psy just Psy category <laughs> takes down Consumer Reports. They've admitted. Well, why don't you tell the story? Because I I think you you've got it here on the on iMore today in a, in, a, in the chronological. Order. I, I, I could start by saying it made headlines last week when Consumer Reports said uh, we're not going to recommend for the first time in years a Mac, the new MacBook Pro because battery life is inconsistent. Apple uh, responded immediately, well, we're not sure what they're doing. It, their results don't match our results. Yeah. We'll get back to you. So take it from there. So it was the, the results were bewildering, um, and I don't say that lightly. They, they were getting, for you know, in some cases, I think it was 14 to 18 hours in some tests and three in another. And if you've used a MacBook, anything in the 14 to 18 hour range should just set off tremendous big glowing red neon light bulb because uh, that's that's just, I think, beyond the laws of physics at this point. Uh, and likewise, anything that has that range of, of uh, disparity, something that's going from 18 to three hours in the same range of tests, uh, as just someone who's done battery testing in the past would set off huge alarm bells with me and the old school IT guy in me would want to take apart every link in every chain and every part of that process to identify and isolate what was causing the variance and see if I could, you know, figure that out. But, um, you know, you, you can assign whatever you want to this. I have my own pet theories about it. But Consumer Reports decided to publish right before the holidays. Uh, and it made huge headlines because Consumer Reports for the first time didn't recommend uh, a MacBook. It was their James uh, Comey letter. <laughs> it totally was. And the, other, and the other part that was baffling was that their test showed that Chrome got significantly better or didn't have the problems with battery life that Safari has done. Which is not what and anybody that, who uses a no. Mac experience no other test has ever shown that usually right. it's it's like about i think 10 to 15 percent battery life reduction when you use chrome just because they're not using the cpu optimizations that apple uses because they're a cross-platform browser i mean there, were, there was just a lot of things that were problematic with the report to the degree that i think a lot of people said that they would just never have published it uh in that state uh then there was a lot of back and forth people were looking into it eventually apple and consumer reports got together and it turns out that the tests that consumer reports ran uh flagged a developer option to turn off the local cache uh, which is not something that Apple sets by default, it is, is a couple layers uh, hidden away and not a normal user would never use it and was buggy in the version of uh, Yosemite that shipped on the original, on those versions of the MacBook Pro. So when you fit, when they fixed that, uh, Consumer Reports is now retesting everything. But it was, it made for a very interesting holiday uh, season. So I least. guess it's, I mean, Consumer Reports defends the, the, the decision to turn off the cache saying, well, it's going to be a, a more rely, I don't know why, but it, you're right. It's not how consumers would normally use it, um, but then then there was it was further compounded by a bug. And Consumer Reports is focusing on the bug. In their press release, they said Apple fixes bug uncovered by Consumer Reports testing. 
uh, and they're yeah. and and Apple says, well, you guys didn't test for it. You did a stupid test. Uh, and then, and no, they didn't say it quite like that, but I think one of the problems the internet has and, and the community has in general is that multiple things can be true. And we yes. just like the state, like these could be bad tests Spin and there could way. be bad batteries. Yeah. So, I mean, those, those both, but unless, unless you can fix, make the test not bad, you can't really prove bad batteries. So to me, like you fix the test, then you have the discussion about the batteries. And if you can prove that they're bad, that has to be a big problem on Apple's radar. So consumer report says they're going to retest with that, uh, box on un unchecked or what are they going to do? They, they are I believe they've got the fixed version of it. I don't know what they're going to do with their test. I mean, my ad absurdium argument is you could turn off the browser and test, but there's nobody who's going to run a browser without the browser being on. Right. So, like, you have to have some norms of testing. Otherwise, the degree of deviance becomes so high that it's really hard to control for anything in that stack. Yeah. Uh, so they are looking at it. My my problem is, you know, if I get if I want to get into it, is that it, it's really hard to be relevant on the internet now. There's so much competition. It's not the days where everyone bought the giant consumer reports and that was the only source for buying recommendations. There's everything from Wirecutter to Sweet Home to CNET to everything there. And it's really hard to get attention. And I think that CNET, sorry, sorry um, Consumer Reports saw a lot of attention over the years with smartphones. And last year it was Samsung's waterproofing. And the year before that, it was the bending of the iPhone. And, and I think the, the desire for relevancy sometimes overwhelms the traditional version of because uh, consumer reports has changed significantly over the last few years in the way that they do things and i think the modern consumer reports was not well set up to handle this situation i actually have never really trusted their tech reviews anyway um but uh i thought they had been getting uh better and i'm a i'm a consumer reports uh, subscriber and donor and uh i certainly wouldn't dare, dare buy a dishwasher or a car without at least consulting them first but you, as you make an excellent point, there are also lots more sources for this kind of information, including mm -hmm. Amazon reviews and so forth. And they're pitching me. Like, I mean, the kind of emails you get from these days are are more sensational than I would expect from Consumer That's Reports. That's too about, bad. And the headlines they put on. It's like, yeah. for the first time ever, Apple fails. It's not uh, Consumer Reports detects problems with the battery. It's the first time ever because Apple fails to get recommendation for yeah. it. And I mean, that's their job. Their job is to get attention and maintain their business. But at sometimes well, that's at odds with what I want from them as a consumer. You're saying this was clickbait. I think there was a, I don't want to say it was clickbait, but I think the tests were not run in an acceptable way. You it raise like an interesting a point. Bit of a gotcha, like a gotcha showed up that they thought that they could take advantage of. Right. Yes. And well, you make a good point, though. Enough. If you're an engineer and you see 18 hours and three hours in the same test, you, you, you don't just go, oh, well, there's something wrong. Yeah. You say, why? Right. What's going on here? Yeah, that's what, that's, that's what I do when I'm doing testing. Yeah. Um, but it's, 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 I, I think that, I think that, uh, Consumer Reports was undone a little bit about their uh, about their by their Mr. Spock style testing testing they tend to do with computers. Um, if I don't like their reviews, it's not it's generally generally because they really like something that somebody with a clipboard can check off boxes and put numbers in boxes. When oftentimes it really is not something that's quantifiable. You really have to have a subjective experience that you can then explain that may be relevant or may not be relevant to each individual person. This is why I really love uh, the wire cutter and the smart home reviews because they will say here is a, here is our pick for the best for here's our recommendation for an inexpensive 4K TV. But instead of saying here are the tests we did, here are the graphs, here are the charts, it's an essay on here is what we think is important. Here are the here is what we think that a, a device like this should achieve. Here's how well each of these achieves it, and here is us being open minded about well it doesn't achieve it, but it also does well in this sort of thing. It gives you the it gives the reader the ability to decide. Well, I actually thought that their third best pick was the one for me because they explained the things they like about this are things that I would never use, and the thing that they really liked about the third pick is something. That I, I love, and this is $200 less. Again, I think that Consumer Reports tends to want to say, okay, item number 12, is it possible to delete a file using just the keyboard uh, with a Macintosh? No, so that's minus 10 points, plus 10 points to the to the DOS, <laughs> DOS 3.1 uh, machine. Uh, but it's, it's, it's a hard, I will also, but I will say in their defense that uh, it's, uh, Apple sometimes puts, uh, gives you kind of a bit of a problem like when you're trying to verify that this gets X hours of battery life and you say, well, I'm using Chrome and I'm getting about two hours less. It puts you in the position of saying, should I then redo the test with Safari 
should is it relevant that I have to use a browser that I don't normally use? Uh, is, is it important that, OK, yes, this, this is a battery hog, this is a memory hog, but it's also the browser I like to use and it's been approved for use with a Mac. Sometimes you really this is why you really have to have that ongoing conversation with your readers saying that if I think that the battery life sucks, here is how I've been using it. Here is what I reasonably expect this uh, this uh, battery life to be. And here are instances in which my you might have different results than I will have. Please make your own. And in all in all attempts, you are just giving your own opinion, and you're hoping to let people form their own opinions based on your own experiences. Well, also as you point out, Renee, and <laughs> before they went to press, they just thought, well, let's try the same thing with Chrome, and they say, "quote We got consistently high battery life on all six runs," yep. and that should have been kind of like, as you say, a red flag. I mean, okay, <laughs> maybe there's more, and they should have dug deeper. So, however. Let me ask you the question, Renee. It is true that battery life is weirdly inconsistent on the MacBook Pro, isn't it? Is it not? Absolutely. Well, I mean, so I, I wouldn't say inconsistent. I would say people are not getting the battery life they were promised. And I think that's absolutely a problem. And uh, I I dislike when the discussion gets taken off that topic because of things like removing a battery meter or whether Consumer Reports did their tests right or wrong. In my perfect world, you know, we would focus on the battery life issue. That would be the only thing discussing. And if we're not getting absolutely the battery life that Apple promised us, we would keep holding them accountable for it. Well, I mean, it's Apple complicated because most other companies lie about battery life or overpromise. So, I think as consumers, we're all kind of going, "Well, I, you know." But I, I was, you know, when the MacBook Pro, the new MacBook Pro, got two hours of battery life, which is pretty typically what it will get in normal use for me. It is a little disappointing. I must well, that's outside. That's so, I mean, like, there's, I have a couple. Like, one, one of my thoughts on this is that Apple, in general, they they updated their battery tests a few years ago. Uh, and they got much – most people will tell you they're the most accurate battery Absolutely. test back then yeah. in the industry. But it, that's not now. Like now we're playing Pokemon Go and using Snapchat right. and we're having GPS and screens on all the time. And our web pages are behemoths of JavaScript. Right. And it's not just uh, you're reading your email and surfing the web. That's the inaccurate test of browser lifespan anymore. It's way more it, – it hits well, way harder than that. And it, you know, it's the ultimate your mileage may vary scenario. I mean every – and it's true of phones too. I mean and it's even true for the same person from day to day. So, because we, but you Apple know. is sticking like so. The part that's curious to me is that Apple is absolutely sticking by their estimates. Like they're saying that if you wait for like Photo Agent and Spotlight Index or like everything that happens when you set up a new Mac, if you wait a couple days for that to pass and then you go through what they consider to be a standard set of activities, you will get the battery life they promised. I get less than that. I get a, I get about eight hours instead of ten hours. I'd be uh, on thrilled my with eight activity. hours. I don't know what it well, is. Well, it I'm also doing. depends on the it. configuration. Like the yeah. I'm using the i5, and I'm not like, and I I don't use Chrome, so I get a lot more battery life than somebody using the i7 who's using Chrome or who has a discrete graphics card and is hitting that discrete graphics card yeah, all day. Yeah, I think I have an i7 with a discrete graphics card probably, yeah. and I do use Chrome. So I guess I, I look at it like, oh, I got, I got this is how much I have left. My my battery is so far all over the place because if you're using anything that, that re really works, the computer, right. it's going to be nothing. You right. know, I mean, I have I have if, if you use Hangouts for instance or or Skype, uh, you, you know, on on a battery and you're you know it's going to be you know 45 minutes you know or an hour without being plugged in you know so it, it just really depends on I I just don't I guess I don't care about the hours. <laughs> you know, I don't either because I'm just used to it being all over the place in different. I mean, I just go well. I guess it's learn helplessness. Yeah, it's learned helplessness exactly. <laughs> we're we're all we're, yes, we're all abused users uh, at this point. I you know it's like well there you go. What are you gonna yeah. do? I, it, what it really is is you, you, you're kind of hoping someday that you'll have this thing that just goes and goes and goes and you'll be so happy. Just plug in your fuel cell and come yeah, back it just next goes year. Goes and goes and goes. <laughs> I ordered and I hope to get it in about a month. The new Chromebook Plus from Google and Samsung, and I feel yeah. like that's going to be something that's going to get you know really remarkable battery life but it's easier to do that because you can't run any other apps you're not from here yeah <laughs> yeah you're not <laughs> you know i noticed oh, on the iphone i've been playing field runners attack that thing will kill i mean this the battery life on my iphone 7 plus is amazing yeah but if i play field runners i'm it's like it I, used to be if you ran facebook it would have the battery right, life now right. they're better but snapchat right. is horrible i mean so it's just it's it's so inconsistent i don't i don't think anybody's i mean i don't know Anyway, they're going to retest and then probably end up recommending the MacBook Pro. And we'll there, see. there you go. There you have it. Good year, though, in many respects for iOS, particularly in uh, the App Store. $28 billion year. Uh, this uh, stat comes from Apple. Yep. So it's not one of those made-up stats. 
Oh, they had the biggest day ever on New Year, which surprised me because usually Christmas is the biggest day because everyone's gotten their new iPhones and iPads and are busy downloading apps. Uh, 240, $240 million on New Year's Day. Almost, and a lot of revenue from subscriptions now, too. Geez, almost a quarter of a billion dollars. Wow. But that, like, as they tell you, that is Pokemon Go and Super Mario Run money. That is not like PCALC right. and Prisma right. and uh, other one. Hey, it, you know. It's still pretty. It's still pretty mind-boggling. And remember when he shipped, when he announced the iPhone and shipped it in June of 20, 2007, uh, there was no app store on it. It was and he wanted one percent of the market. He would be happy with one percent yeah. of. The and 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 if you think about the the idea that we just said, but you know, Pokemon Go and Super Mario Brothers, I mean, this is just such a massive gaming platform now. It is compared to a lot of the consoles and everything else. The idea that they can make hundreds of millions of dollars just like that uh, is, is pretty amazing. Whew. Yeah, what is what was the record day for uh, PlayStation Four or Xbox One? I guarantee it wasn't two hundred forty yeah. million. Well, po Pokemon Go's right. record day was New Year's, which is no surprise because the App Store's record day was New Year's. Yeah, right, exactly. Um, let's see. Was there anything from CES about Apple that was worth uh, looking at? Mac Rumors had a, line, a roundup of uh, accessories. <laughs> There's a big accessories pavilion, right? At CES, uh, Apple. Oh yeah, in the North Hall, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Um, but in this case, what headphones? What what? what? Like most, more home kit stuff. Home kit. Yeah. yeah. I did, I didn't notice anything that was remarkable, <laughs> remarkably pro Apple nope. at that at that show. Yeah. The interesting thing is is that I think that um, it'll be see it'll be interesting to see how Apple pushes it. The one thing I did see at CES was I mean there is just such a huge push on home automation. You know the the Internet of Things. I mean we we've been talking about it and it's been building up, but you could really feel it at CES of just everything is going to be automated. You know and 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 everybody is is now those things that we keep on talking about pie in the sky of everything from your toaster to your whatever. I mean you're just seeing multiple. You know Griffin now is I think has a toaster. Attaches to your iPhone, which oh, uh, that's, uh, that's I don't even know. But I was like the the fact that Griffin was releasing toasters and coffee things, you know, uh, was you know that you can just see this incredible move towards towards that process. And so I mean, I think that Apple will either their um, the home kit really has to succeed over the next I think the next twelve to eighteen months, uh, or a lot of people are going to have put something in their house. The 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 those um, that first mover process and so i think they got into it at the right time i don't know if they're putting enough energy into it to to make the turn um i think that you know obviously there's a lot of uh pressure from companies like google and so on and so forth yeah, and alexa was everywhere at ces which was well and that's yeah, yeah i worry i, I, I worry that echo is kind of uh, now starting to uh, take over the world oh and, and when my oh, emergency I'm alert are we having flooding yes this is annoying i wish i could turn that off in the bay area phone. you're having flooding yeah yeah like well, I get Amber alerts miracle. from Southern California, too. I mean, I, I don't know. The yeah, thing for uh, me that is so interesting about the voice assistant and home automation market is how diametrically opposed it is. Like Amazon has this device that has seven beam forming speakers, and it is the absolute best thing if you are in your house. But if you are down the street and you want to turn off your lights because you forgot them, you're stuck. Apple is great because you can just use your iPhone to do it. But then when you're in your house, it doesn't understand you half the time. Yeah. Uh, Amazon is fantastic at having all these APIs and you could talk to them and do all these different services, but only if you speak French and a little bit of German, sorry, English and a little bit of German. If you're French or Chinese or something, totally not a service for you. Apple's good at, at multi-language and even multi-language in a sentence structure, but doesn't have a lot of services yet. I mean, it's like such a turbulent sort of up and down uh, market right now, which is exciting, but also frustrating. Yeah. Yeah. By the way, I've now turned off my alerts. So if there's a flood... <laughs> Just let me know, okay? <laughs> Save Leo. Save Leo. <laughs> what, I'm, what I'm amazed at is, is how quickly, uh, you know, I didn't, you know, I got an elect, uh, I got the, uh, um, I guess I got the dot or whatever, and as well as the echo um, uh, to test at, at the house. And then I got the, the Google Home, you know, in another room <laughs> to, to, you know, dueling uh, systems uh, to see, see how they worked. And I was amazed that my kids, for some reason, just completely kind of gravitated towards the Google Home for really? whatever. Yeah, they just, for some reason, however they're talking to it, it reacts faster or better or more accurately. I, I don't know, but they don't really talk to Alexa at all. They just talk to Google Home. And, and um, the, uh, but I was amazed at how quickly it's become part of their kind of da daily routine. You know, like I thought that it would be something goofy that I put in there and I'd, you know, call up songs, but my wife uses it all the time. My kids use it all the time. The, uh, my, oh, yeah. my father-in-law, you know, said he'd rather have you know, one of those than, than a new iPhone, you know, I'm like, you just, you know, it's just a, 
the thing that he's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's amazing how quickly that becomes part of your, your, your lifestyle. I have both a Google home and, uh, an echo in my bedroom. And I find that they're, I'm kind of fighting, they're, they're kind of fighting it out between themselves <laughs> because I, I, I try to remember, it really is like having two personal assistants in the office. Cause I know that for instance, uh, they, they, they do a lot of things that, that overlap. Oddly enough, uh, Alexa is better at actually adding things to my Google Calendar and my, my to-do <laughs> list because there's a lot of stuff that hasn't been hooked up yet. But I can ask Google Home some really complicated things. Yeah. Like not, I don't, I don't have to say what, to, what is this so-and-so's birthday? I can say how many years has it been since this person made a, released a movie or you know, what is the weight of 11.1 uh, liters of motor oil? And it will tell me that would be about like 18 grams. Wow. What's and I think that, that might this be year we're going to see like for, I think that might be why Alexa works better for me because I, you know, I kind of know how to ask questions to a, to a search engine. Um, and my kids just are more, much more natural about asking crazy things and, and so on and so forth. I think maybe that might be why it. Yeah. I mean, it's clear that Google home is better at uh, Googly kind of searches. It's knowledge base is much right. better. I, I use the echo probably more and I have more echoes all around the place, of course. Uh, and be it was all over CES. I mean, there, there's yeah. echo everywhere at CES. Yeah, what's going to be super interesting people. is that this year Apple's going to ship more Siri, uh, Google's going to ship more Google Assistant, um, but Alexa is going to be on Huawei, Viv is going to be on Samsung. You'll be able to get three different Android phones with three different assistants on it, uh, and then the battle for the house continues because Xbox, you know, Microsoft and Cortana are still there as well. So no, no easy answers. Uh, let me just ask all of the uh, panelists from now on. I have pledged not to say the A word anymore on our shows, and I ask you not to say the A S C words on uh, any of our shows, C for Cortana, uh, and just refer to it as Echo. Now, that doesn't solve the problem for the many people in our audience who, after finally giving up that we're never going to stop saying the A word, changed their trigger word to Echo. Now they're going to be pissed. But, <laughs> Did I just buy a lot of dollhouses? Yeah, you said? might have bought a lot of dollhouses. <laughs> Somebody said we should just call it Amazon Voice Services. I think that's too many words. And, and it, what's interesting is it is the Echo. The product is called the Echo. But, Angus, we'll but the Angus. personification of it is so important, which is where, by the way, that's a bet that Google has missed. There's no, yes, they just, it's just Google. Google doesn't believe in, in anthropomorphizing it. They ah. want to make a Star Trek machine. They want to be computer. Ah. Uh, and it's a very conscious decision on their part. Interesting. Yeah. I've, I've, I haven't, I haven't spoken to them officially about it, but I've talked to some engineers that said that they really do believe that this should not be gender specific. It should be, here is a device and you are allowed to have whatever sort of a, identity to it that you decide to have i think they're wrong and apple wants a pixar like character that is funny and yeah. conversational i think they're wrong i think Puppy. i like it personified yeah. i don't want it to be cutesy there's a real you know there's a you there's an art to making this and that's another thing you saw at ces is personified robots um <laughs> I yeah i think it's I important. like clowns they're clown terrifying no they shouldn't be like clowns that's the point is that there is a you can make you can make it appealing so it no longer seems like a machine. I understand Google's point of view. Well, you shouldn't anthropomorphize machines. But, in fact, we want we want to do that. So, you know, I, I think... Well, also, also, they don't like the inherent sexism of, I'm going to have my, my sister is going to be a woman. Well, so. then make it a man. I mean, Siri, you can make a man. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, it's default a man in, in England and several yeah, other countries. Yeah. Um, you can't do that Ultimate with Echo. Back. Echo is always a lady named the A word. But uh, I just I think personifying it helps for some reason. It makes it, it more makes appealing. it more relatable. Yeah. Our show today brought to you by FreshBooks. If you are in business for yourself or you're a small business, you know that the accounting is like the last thing you want to do, unless you're an accountant. But for most of us, uh, we wish we wish we didn't have to do the paperwork, the invoices at the end of every month, the tax preparation. You know, in April or when do you when do you guys in Canada do it? Your taxes are due. April? Okay. Yeah. I thought you had a month. It's like Thanksgiving that you were a month earlier or later or something. Uh, uh, no, end of April, yeah. Oh, no, we're April 15th. Oh, okay. So, yeah, we're end of April. You have a little extra time. In any event, FreshBooks is from Canada, but they don't care because they'll, they <laughs> have, they, you work in any currency you want. I build Canada with my, from, you know, it was great because, you know, handling currencies, handling expenses, uh, keeping track of how you're doing, you can go to the brand new FreshBooks dashboard. You'll love this, by the way, if you haven't seen it. 
and you'll know immediately how you're doing, what invoices have been paid, what invoices are outstanding, what your expenses have been, what your profit and loss is. You'll know if you're making money. You'd be amazed how many freelancers and uh, you know small businesses don't even know if they're profitable till it comes to tax time. And oh, we made money, or oh, we didn't make money. Well, now you'll know all the time. It really helps you do a better job. You'll also get paid faster because those invoices have a pay button on them. On average, 11 days faster. I'm telling you, this is the only way to do it. If you're running a business, do what I did back in 2004 when I was when I was just swamped by invoices, fresh books that will allow you to track time and hours in their app or on the website. They'll keep track of everything. That new dashboard is phenomenal. It's, they've completely redesigned fresh books. And of course, you get accounting reports like sales tax summary, profit and loss, but you also get an easy way to digest real quickly how you're doing. Try it free for 30 days at freshbooks.com slash MacBreak. And in our MacBreak Weekly in the How Did You Hear About Us section, FreshBooks, I love it. I can I can absolutely testify. It is great. Freshbooks.com slash MacBreak. Uh, moving right along, Andy Anako from the Chicago Sun-Times, Renee Ritchie, from iMore, he's editorial director at Mobile Nations. From uh, the Pixel Core, Alex Lindsay, who's run off for a moment. But he's left <laughs> us a nice view of his microphone. Uh, I We just, uh, you know, I've been using the uh, AirPods, loving them. Uh, I can wear them at bed at night and listen to a book. And I can even put my head on the pillow and it yep. works. Um, I'm not crazy about the, you know, double tap activation for Siri. But, but in general, I really like these headphones. We did do uh, an interview on Saturday on the screensavers on the new screensavers with Kyle Weems of uh, I Fix It, who they if they did a teardown. He said there's a lot yep. of glue in here, <laughs> zero on the repairability scale. That's I mean you know, I wouldn't expect head earbuds or air, you know headphones to be. They're hard to make. Turns out. Yeah, I wouldn't expect them to be repairable. Uh, and one of the things he dinged Apple for, he said they're not only not repairable. We I don't think they're recyclable. And I, they, Kyle has been hard on Apple lately about recyclability. And I don't, I don't know what to think. I, I think he's probably right that it is difficult to recycle. On the other hand, uh, just today, Greenpeace declared Apple the greenest tech company for the third year in a row. Um, now, I don't know. This may not refer to recyclability particularly. It looks like they grade them on uh, clean energy, uh, energy transparency, renewable energy commitment. That new campus is 100% renewable, right? Yeah. All solar. Energy efficiency and mitigation. Renewable procurement. I'm not sure what that is, but they do give Apple an A in all of those categories and a B in advocacy, but that's better than anybody else. They don't mention yeah, recycling, so maybe that's why. Well, it's also, I mean, again, like multiple truths. Uh, Apple could, like, there could be certain products that are less recyclable than others, but in aggregate, they might be doing a very good job in terms of recyclability right. compared to what other people in that industry are doing. Like how, how easy to recycle are Jaybirds or how easy to recycle are the Yeah, I mean, like, no, you, I'm sure no, ed, no head earbuds are recyclable at all. And they're small enough that, well, okay, maybe we can tolerate the landfill. But uh, Kyle said, do, you know, buy something that's more recyclable. Do not buy AirPods. And I'm not sure I'd agree with well, that. Well, yeah, I mean, well, yeah, I think they'll get there. Yeah. You, you got to give him a mulligan on that one. It's like at some point you, you got so <laughs> you're, you're lucky it fits in an ear, <laughs> let alone, <laughs> you know, let alone that it's recyclable content. It's like, OK, I'm, I'm 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 willing to I'm willing to accept that if we become 12 minutes closer to Armageddon because of the waste <laughs> created, contributed by the uh, AirPods, I'm willing to die 18 minutes earlier than <laughs> than we might. Well, have. Thanks for doing that for us, Sandy. I <laughs> appreciate it. <laughs> well, I mean, like none of this stuff used to be recyclable, and now we've got computers that are more recyclable right. than ever. And we'll right. we'll get there. But anything that's cutting edge is just such a hard, and that's not an excuse. It's just a reality of yeah of the industry. I'm, it's not something that Apple's singled out for. Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm more concerned about uh, computers that you feel like you don't really own because you can't fix them yourself, you can't upgrade them yourself, you can't do anything but take it back to the store and hope that they haven't watched, haven't been shown a training video three weeks earlier saying, try to sell them a new machine. Tell them that it's, because because it's uh, the, the, the first time that I needed to get a, a MacBook fixed and I was told that it was gonna cost me $1,200 to fix a broken trackpad because that's integrated into the entire lower lower half of the, of the machine. I said, oh, this is definitely not, <laughs> this is definitely not the outcome come i was hoping for and i'm going to i will i will simply buy a 30 dollar mouse rather than 1200 dollars to have this it's fixed. a big 
problem too. I mean, I went, I took my car, my car got hit badly at the airport and the entire side was scratched because oh, nobody seems to care about car. It, I mean, it happens, but I took it in and they're like, well, it's not a separate panel anymore. This is, this yeah. is actually the entire side of the car and it makes up all, and it's going to cost, you know, over a thousand dollars to fix. And it was like very small thing. Uh, and it's just, it's, their argument is that they're making this stuff in a way that is more efficient at the beginning, but it, it offloads all the cost to you at the end. Yeah. Yeah. Apple's new ad, I've seen it a few times, uh, promotes portrait mode. And uh, I, I don't, is this Greece? Where is this? Uh, yes. It looks like Montenegro or I, I, Croatia. It's Greece. Okay. I, and the music yeah. is interesting too. You're not going to hear any speech, but I'll, I'll describe it. It's a small town and a young woman arrives with her rose gold iPhone 7. She shows she takes a picture of her grandma at a cafe shows her portrait mode the grandma gets so excited she says what a great photograph now everybody wants the young lady to take their picture so she goes all over town taking really really good pictures <laughs> i loved all the images in this i don't think she, yeah they're the, the I mean, oh, obviously, a professional did these, but uh, and the light is perfect. It's the golden hour, and, but nevertheless, is this what, Greek what, music? I don't. What was hilarious for me is that this exact thing happened to me. I had a bunch of family and friends of family over, and I took a photo of one of them, and then I had to take a photo of everyone. <laughs> the part they don't show you in this commercial, though, is the worst part, where it's like, did you send the photos yet? Did you send them yet? Did you send them yet? I didn't get oh, them yet. Where are the yeah. photos? Where's my photos? photos? Where's my photos? You didn't send my photos. That's funny. <laughs> I had, I got I. Had the exact same problem Renee only it was, it was with total strangers on Christmas Day I was in New York City I was taking pictures like in front in front of like uh, uh, in front of the, uh, uh, the the big like giant Christmas ornaments in front of rock uh, in front of uh, uh, Radio City Music Hall and of course so, so oh here's here's a person someone who's completely alone he has nothing better to do uh, like a foreigner like a uh, foreign uh, tourist hands well oh, can you take a picture like oh yes that's perfect that's fine and so I take a picture it's composed very well he looks at it and then Carter like shows it to someone else and I didn't know he was with like 40 other family members and my, yeah. <laughs> the, the picture came out so well everybody wanted the camp pictures taken and like I was there for 15 minutes saying oh god Dang it. <laughs> I don't know how to say buzz Thanks, off Apple. in whatever language they're in. <laughs> now, I've had a kind of a similar problem. Every time I go to the pool now, people want me to put music on and dive off the high dive. Yes. So <laughs> it's infuriating. Thanks, Apple. <laughs> Thanks, Apple. I kind of like that ad too. Although I have to say, the music does not sound like that out of the iPhone speakers. I just want, to, and I doubt you'd be able to hear it from the high dive. But it is a fun ad. <laughs> and nobody has any, uh, you know, one thing you notice that nobody had any wist, wisty hair. You know, like, like you know, like. Oh, yeah, and the uh, portrait stuff. Is, everybody looks beautiful. They don't, yeah, none of them look the like Renee. Place that my, my, I, 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 uh, my first test with my iPhone when my daughter had come down, you know, uh, uh, from uh, waking up and her hair was everywhere. And I'm doesn't just, handle that very well. I'll just turn the music down while we, you can t continue to talk while we watch. And it was a little, little chunky. I, so portrait mode does not there. work perfectly all the time, and it is no. Well, it's it's the function of it's the function of what happens, you know, what it what it I think uh, uh, of how it's calculating that. Yeah. It, it's still not a it's it's not a large right. sensor. It's not right. a choice. It's not true. Well, it's not doing what I know. thought it would be doing, which is taking two photos, one of the background out of focus and one of the foreground in focus. I don't. Why doesn't it do that? That seems like that would be the that would give you a real portrait mode, right? Well, yeah, it still so has to, the problem is it still needs that data to figure out where yeah. where does it do that. And, you know, when it comes in, it's... Oh, it has to figure out where the foreground is. Yeah, that's more important. And blur, blurring it, uh, you know, the, the math behind... Well, you don't have to... It, so here's what I would... Well uh, so uh, tell me why you don't... By the way, he just dived off the board and the music sounds great and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> uh, <laughs> that's why there was music in the back. Uh, why don't we... Okay, we got two lenses. Right. Uh, you're taking a picture. It focuses. It knows what you're taking a picture of. Why does it not take then an an out of focus well, picture? It knows of, where uh, that. It knows where that point is that it's taking that it, you know or the set of points. It, it, it's a small oh, number I get of it. points that that it knows exactly where those are. And it still has to, to merge to those two that. together. Well, like, no, well, no, but I'm saying it's not grabbing your whole face when it says that something's in focus. It's saying I'm grabbing your forehead or your eye or your I nose see. or whatever. I'm going to grab see. that and put that in, and then and then I'm going to focus on that distance and everything else kind of that is in that region goes into focus. Then it but what it has to figure out is I mean, the, the, the calculating the lens blur is, you know, there's lens blur calculations that can be done. And, and so it's it's doing a realistic lens blur in the background. 
the um, well, but why can't why I don't understand why it's not just having an out of focus second image because because the, the hard part is not the lens the blur it doesn't need to take a photo out of focus oh, okay. it can do that on its own it anyway. you know, what it what it needs is you know like what it needs is to figure out what is at that distance and and where really where does it cut that edge out right you know so it's how does it, it know it in other words what's the foreground and, and so what's it's background. doing multi-layer too it's doing multi multiple layers not yeah. just foreground background. oh it's not just two no. Yeah, it's, no. it's grabbing a couple. It's grabbing, I don't know, I think from the demo, it's it was like eight to ten samples. What? Really? Of depth. Yeah. Oh, wow. And so and so it's grabbing that that data, you know, in, um, uh, and again, when we talk about AR, that data is going to be very useful in the future. You know, you know, like like that, you know, it grabbing that data to, to figure out what portrait is. And I have a feeling that a lot of us are unwittingly guinea pigs and part of the R&D project. <laughs> well, they <laughs> of, said that. They said that we're training it. What? Yeah. They said that we're train we're helping train it right now in the beta yeah, process. Yeah, we're helping train that process on on how how it gets it gets really good at figuring out that 3D data. But where it really has a problem is in calculating. That's why, like, if you have little hair, little bits of hair that are you know like messy hair or something blowing in the wind, you know, figuring out those every little hair and exactly where it is in 3D is not is 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 hard all the time and very hard to do you know in a calculation. So you'll notice that almost everybody you know has shorter cropped hair or they have you know, the hair is pretty well, you know, uh, maintained, not just lots of, of, you know, wisty, you know, and, and you'll see that if you take a picture, you'll see the before and after of the of, in portrait mode, you'll kind of see, you can, you can definitely see where it, you know, grabbed onto those things. And there's nothing reflective because it really struggles with reflection still. Yeah. Getting back real also quickly to the uh, AirPods, uh, there was an app to help you find your missing AirPods, but it's gone. Yeah. Uh, did it work? We saw that coming, right? Well, it worked ish like it was trying to there was a couple ways you can try to find an airpod one is using the bluetooth connection to sort of figure out uh try to figure out and that was that was sort of what they were doing and that was unreliable i just turned the music on really loud and i can almost yeah, always you find figured them. it out yeah yeah so this i mean uh, this was hard not to see coming because it's a four dollar app that uses apple ip sort of willy-nilly and is probably a feature that's on apple's roadmap that if they killed uh -huh. when something else came out would get probably more outrage than killing right. it now right and uh, and it didn't work that well, right? I mean, like Mac Rumors had their own set of tests for it. I I just find that anything that tries to detect based on like you have to have a really sophisticated service with tight integration and the ability to control like we, like with those Bluetooth dongles. Those companies have really good control over those dongles to help you find things like your keys and all those kind of things. They have no insight into where the AirPod actually is. Most right. they can try to determine the strength of signal. Right. Okay. So different floors. So uh, we there no truth to the rumor that Apple just wanted to make an extra sixty nine bucks. No, I mean they would much no. They want you to buy another set of AirPods. They don't want to piss you off yeah, because yeah, you lost. No. I, I think that's true, and they certainly don't want to have get the get the reputation of oh they're easy to lose and hard to find. So yeah, and yeah. also like if this app doesn't work, like it's hard to distinguish this from an right. Apple app. Like some people just think this is the official find your AirPods. Yeah, and good point. Yeah, if it doesn't work. It's frustrating. Yeah. yeah. Uh, let's see. Foxconn says, yeah, we might, uh, replace all of our manufacturer, uh, uh, employees with robots. So there's yeah. that. Also first ever profit decline. Actually, let's talk about profit decline because Apple's um, apparently missed its, missed its annual, uh, 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 operating goals and it hurt Tim Cook's bottom line. He got a 15% cut in his bonus. I'm sure he's crushed he well, actually, he's giving it all away anyway so. he's gonna yeah. have to sell he's gonna have to sell a couple teslas and the, yeah <laughs> uh he's making enough money uh, but it's yeah. still that's a little you know i mean people this is uh at this point it's not it's it's about keeping score right and it's also nice to see this where some companies lose money and their executives right. get untold bonuses. Get bonuses anyway yeah yeah actually tim is compensated much more i think we talked about this last week much more poorly than some of the other uh, yep. Executive Angela Irons makes more than Tim Cook does. Well, they had to they had to get her away from Burberry. They didn't have to get him away from oh, Compact was a long time ago. Right. And again, he probably figures I'm making enough. And he got a huge stock grant when he became CEO. Right. right. <laughs> uh, da, 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 da. Apple I think, Watch I think sales up I, way up over uh, the holidays, according to Slice. Um, Slice keeps track of deliveries uh, and. According to uh, Apple Watch deliveries, a huge spike over Cyber Weekend. And they're still out of stock. I mean, you still cannot go to a store and get. That's, I think, one of the most underreported supply problems of the year is that you just can't get Apple Watch 2s. 57% increase uh, year over year. 
That's got to be also the drop in price on the uh, Series 1, right? There's that. I mean, there's a couple of things playing into this. And one is it's, it's really odd to watch the smartwatch conversation right now because uh, because of delays with Android Wear and, you know, Motorola Me being out of the business and um, which one getting sold to. Uh, yeah, Pebble sold to Fitbit. Pebble but getting Fitbit's sold. not doing that well and blah, blah, no, blah. No, and the whole conversation was that smartwatches are doomed. Meanwhile, Apple Watch is like doing gangbusters and it's not even in stock. If they if they had had actual stock of Apple Watch 2s, they would have had much, much better results for right. this. I mean, it's that's. That's sort of the try the tragedy of not having all those watches in the stores for the holidays. But like you said, the Apple Watch Series One being cheaper, much easier to get into, and also Apple's messaging was much better. It was much more focused on fitness, and people understand that. They understand the value prop, uh, and they're more likely to go in and maybe think about the Apple Watch One because it's cheaper, and then maybe see the Nike version or one of the other versions that they think is prettier and get upsold. So there's there's a lot of upside for them this year. Does Serenity I think, I think Caldwell play hockey and roller derby? No, she used the word hockey helmet because, like that, that's what they use. She has a hockey helmet and a different helmet, but but that it's was her roller derby stand. helmet. It looks like R two D two because her roller derby name is R two Detonator. Yes, D two Nate. Yeah, D two Nate. Sorry. And yes, yeah, sorry, that's better. And apparently, she likes her AirPods because they fit right in and out like that. I hope she's amazing. Work. They fit under two because they fit under baseball. <laughs> I mean, they're, they're really good for. Can you, what happens when you talk to somebody and you're wearing a toque? Does it block? It just covers the no. It just covers the top, and oh. the antennas poke down. Nice, and it keeps them from falling out. <laughs> yeah, the the hoodie is harder because the hoodie can knock them out when you put it on or off. <laughs> but the toque is awesome. <laughs> I actually like them su surprisingly much. Not having a wire. It, all right, I admit it. It's kind of nice not to have wires. <laughs> I went into Tim Hortons and there were three people, two or three people wearing them. And then I went to IGA, which is our supermarket, and there was like two or three people wearing them there. That's more than I've seen people wearing smartwatches. Mostly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's pricey. I understand and, and all that, but they're they're really kind of they're kind of convenient. And I think we're going to get used to how they look. I don't think people are going to say a thing about it in a, in a little. It'll be while. like earbot earpods in yeah, a few years. Just another thing. Well, and I think I think that we're. You know, in the same way that we have uh, augmented reality for vision, I think that there's somewhere in the future there is augmented reality from a hearing perspective, where where we're going to have basically hearing aids that you can't see, they will be like a phone app or or whatever, and that's going to be totally integrated with our you know with our phone, and that's going to give us just tons of data, you know, all the time, you know, and and it's going to get you know, I think it's going to get to a point where you know if you think about about, about you know AR, you might you might even get into a situation where you have some glasses on that that uh you know tell you oh that's you know by the way that's leo you know you know like like you know you hear i know i want like, that you know, that would be fine to have it whisper in my ear yeah you know and, what about and the augmented you, nose ring leo's got you know he leo's has got two children kids. one named yeah, Abby, exactly. one yeah. named henry <laughs> he's kind of a dick but other than that you like him <laughs> and then you will know and you'll go oh hi leo and you'll say it yeah, yeah, you're kind of a dick, right. but i like you <laughs> yeah, no, by, just, the, yeah. by the way you're, you're on a show with him you know remember <laughs> yes. to, remember to you ask may him do a show. you may remember you did a show <laughs> yeah, exactly. i need that soon i need that right away <laughs> i always imagine it with glasses but i think you're right i think uh the audio thing is even Look, more surreptitious. Well, and all these people, all these people who did LASIK are gonna be like, ah, oh, you know, because <laughs> I gotta wear know, glasses. I just got rid of my glasses. Because guys like us, we just all we have to do is just get the prescription for the glasses. By and the that, way, that's, that's why I didn't get LASIK because the doctor said, oh, and by the way, you'll still have to wear glasses for reading. Right. And it was like, well, <laughs> not gonna Wait do for it. For augmented LASIK, they'll, they'll just they'll do the LASIK and put the lens in your eye. That's what I mean. That's yeah, what good. I mean. Uh, Apple has, uh, LinkedIn has had to remove its Apple app, its iOS app and its Android app from the app store. Uh, actually Apple had, I guess, to take it out of the app store there and Google had to take it out of the, its app store. New York Times in China. In, in Russia, the New York Times in China. Um, it's, it's hard. This is, it's a hard world to, to survive in these days if you're a multinational. Russia says we have a law that's, and actually this is a, not a bad law if you take it in the right spirit, that data about Russian citizens has to be stored on servers in Russia, not somewhere else. Yeah, China had the same law, and I think Apple had to localize, or Apple yeah. and other companies had to localize the data there, too. <clears throat> and I don't know what to say. I mean, if you're in a country, if you, I mean, of course, what we know is really what we, I, what I think is Russia wants the access to the data, and it's easier to do if it's a Russian server. But, uh, and what better access, by the way, than your LinkedIn connections, you know? But, um, 
If oh, you and want. Montenegro, I mean, wants that, wants a local data center, and <laughs> yeah. Albania wants a local well, data center. Well, but they get it. I mean, uh, Nia if you want to operate in a country, you got to follow their laws, right? I mean, that's just the way it is. Or you can move out of the, leave the country. Yeah, and, and that's what Google did when China said, hey, great search engine, everybody using it. We'd like to, we'd like you to, and Google said, actually, no, we don't have to have any presence in your country. You, we, we, can't, we can't rebuild our entire search engine to serve the needs of the state, and so therefore we're out. Uh, yeah. But that's not happening with these individual apps, uh, and that's going to be a increasingly kind of sticky situation as the years go by uh, because in the uh, in the EU there are a lot of regulations about here is what uh, here's here's the data that you're allowed to retain here's the, how quickly you have to get re release data uh, here is what you should if someone says that there's something on the internet that is not true you're responsible for not leading people to that piece of data uh, it really is becoming a morass of individual little uh, fiefdoms of uh, of rules and then that's not even talking about the ways that this data can be abused by a nation that decides that it it's done killing journalists and it would like to just kidnap them and interrogate them and also kill their friends and also kill their neighbors and also kill people they've been calling on the phone. Uh, so it's going to get worse before it gets better, I think. And uh, Pokemon Go has been banned from the iPhone launch in China while State Sensor evaluates security risks. Tom and no. Bulbasaur, yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, are they worried that people are going to wander into the street? What are they worried about? Or is it the location data that they're, they're worried about? Uh, it's location hard. data. Go ahead. Oh, go ahead. Uh, I'll, uh, it, it, it's familiar to a lot of conversations I've had with people about uh, Chinese censorship. That what they really uh, that one th one thing that is just uh, the, the government is culturally worried about is anything that helps people to gather together in groups. So even there's the, <clears throat> the 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 classic example being a knitting group has been was broken up because not because they were knitting dissent but because it's a group of people that was basically getting together and forming some sort of a club with among themselves uh, that they really wanted to kind of stay ahead of and not really not really encourage uh, so it uh, on that basis uh, and the consistency of those uh, conversations I've had I'm not surprised that it, on top of whatever privacy concerns there are on top of whatever uh, reasonable laws there are about the use of such apps part of it is that this is an app that can use be used to create a mob in a certain place and that's something that it's like it's like a if you're if your uncle was a formal former firefighter he is going to yell at you if he visits you at the house and he sees that there's carpeting within four feet of electrical outlet because he is institutionally programmed to think that's a very bad thing uh the chinese government is institutionally programmed to think that anything that encourages and enables people to get together in groups is something that needs to be monitored closely at the very minimum and it has been it has been an issue in the past for them. <laughs> so, you know, there was there was a I don't know what year it was, but they, they said there was an estimated like 10,000 riots, you know, in, in, in China at one point in one year, wow. Wow. you know, and, and you, know, you have a lot of very disparate groups that are all clumped together and um, and not all of them are doing great. And uh, we, I know we don't have any any uh, experience with that. Nothing like States. that happens here. No. Right. So but but I think that there's there hasn't been a lot of outlets. And when there was people do use these technologies. And I think that you only have to look at at, you know, the Middle East and, and so on and so forth to see, you know, you can see why governments that especially that are a little bit maybe a little bit more authoritarian and more centralized uh, would be um, very concerned about people being able to to, to sort that out. You know, here's, here's something you don't want to see when you open your backpack. Stephen Frappier was at the uh, uh, Fort Lauderdale Airport during that. Well, it, it's better than the it's better than the, <laughs> the other alternative. Yeah, it, during the horrific shooting of last week, he had his backpack flap was slightly open. It turned out he was shot in the back, and the MacBook Pro in the backpack took the bullet, and likely saved his life. The bullet ended up in the backpack's front pocket, just sitting there. Um, My only note to Apple is I would send him a new one. Like that'd be good PR. Yeah. <laughs> That's right. send him yeah. They, they, they would probably want to capture that data to see I mean, what exactly much, happened. How, but then he'll how, hate how much, the touch much, bar and it'll be much, bad publicity. And how much how much thinner can we make this without costing people lives? <laughs> right. <laughs> well, here's denser, so. here's the sad thing. This one actually had a MagSafe port and it looks like an SD card. So I'm sad mm. because. That's that's worth keeping around. They still sell those. They still. Sell oh, that's those. right. Do they still sell those? Yeah. yeah, you can get the last year's MacBook Pro, 13 and 15 inch still. 
Is there a discount? Uh, they, well, the new ones are more expensive, so relatively speaking. <laughs> but no break, huh? Let's take a break right now. And your picks, your tips. If uh, Renee's got a really good one, that I didn't mention on, on his website, but he's going to do his another pick. But if, uh, but I will, in conjunction with your pick, mention okay. a pick that you did on your website, if that makes any sense at all. That's coming up. But first, a word from Zip Recruiter. If you're the person in your neck of the woods that does the hiring for your company, maybe because you're the boss, or because you're in HR, or just because you know the boss told you, hey. Get somebody to fill that position. You got to know about ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter really makes it possible to find the perfect employee. Let's just assume that the right person for that job opening is there somewhere out there looking. Let's hope looking, right? How do you find them? Well, you could just post on you know a job board and cross your fingers that that person looks at that job board. Or you can go to ZipRecruiter and post there and to 200 plus, 200 plus job boards including social networks with one click of the mouse. Over that that's a by the way it used to be 100 it's now 200 job boards. Uh, this is a great time to go to ziprecruiter.com. We've got a free trial. By the way, don't worry, don't freak out. It doesn't mean you're going to get all those resumes in your email or phone calls to your phone because everybody who applies, who responds gets filtered into the ZipRecruiter interface, which allows you to screen them further with true-false questions or essay questions, multiple choice, whatever format works for you. Eliminate the candidates that just don't match and pick the right person fast. Screen them, rate them, and hire the right person fast right there in the interface. No wonder now more than a million businesses use ZipRecruiter. A million businesses, including some very, very big businesses. We use it, too, here at, uh, at Twit. Post your jobs on ZipRecruiter for free by going to ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. We thank ZipRecruiter for their support of Mac Break Weekly. If you've got to do the hiring, give yourself a break. Use ZipRecruiter. ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. Time for our picks of the week. I never start with, the, with the Alex Lindsay. I think <laughs> this time I'm going to start with you. I pray you have something very expensive for us. No sound, though. That's one thing we don't have from you. We have silence from Alex. Did you mute Sorry, yourself? I was grabbing my pick, and I didn't want to make a bunch of wrestling during the wrestling. Oh, what'd you get? So, no, it's not very big. It was just, it was just connected to things. Um, so um, this is a production uh, recommendation. Um, this, it's called an MDHX, and it's made by a company called Decimator. Now, when these guys came out, you know, they, they make a lot of converters that are similar to what Blackmagic makes and, and, and AJA. Um, and when they came out, it was always these rough metal things, you know, and you're always kind of like, I don't know if that's actually going to work. <laughs> and, um, you know, I mean, like literally when they bought when they came out, you'd see them at, at NAB and you'd be like, it's like something Colleen put together. Is that what you're saying? Oh, no, you're just, <laughs> In the just shop, like, with a soldering like, iron and a drill. I think <laughs> some kid welded this thing together, you know, and and um, and so anyway, but they, they every year they get more and more refined. And this thing has I it looks nice. Uh, what does it do, though? Okay, so what this does is <laughs> I it's mean, a I like it, but what the hell does it do? <laughs> it's a cross converter and scaler for HDMI and SDI. Oh, um, so it is. I mean, it is. I so I don't travel without one of these. So I have one of these in my bag um, all the time, and it's like, oh, I need to connect an SDI signal to an to an HDI monitor, or I've got an HDMI my output of my computer, and I need to go SDI. Oh, and I also need to convert it from 1080p to 720p or 1080i to 720p or or the other way around. All of those things it can do. Oh, and it also does one to four distribution. So I got one SDI signal and I need to go to four other things. Um, oh, this sounds like so, something that I could see why you would use this then. And and, and, yeah. and as a as a as a production person, just having the, and we I don't know how many we have. The, we probably have twenty or thirty of these at this point because they sit in our cases as these little pieces of glue. We try not to design around them, but but they're like this little thing. Oh, we need one more computer to go into the into the switcher, or we need you know, and we need to figure out why it's not connected and and everything else. And so it is uh, it is something that we use you know all the time on every project. Um, and I, so I thought it would be worth. Uh, mentioning it um and uh but they are it, and it has a little interface so you can do everything from these little front buttons and it was funny i use these little front buttons and there's like this little led thing that you you get really good at going through to you know oh, i need this and i need this and you and you and it's funny i was talking to the guys at the office and they were like i don't know how the led works and i was like well how do you change it <laughs> and there's like a little there's a little usb here uh an old 
mini USB actually that'll pop up a web page that you can oh. make all the adjustments. And I was like, "There's a web page?" You know, you know, like this is like <laughs> that's pretty cool. For like three or four years. I mean, all I know is little white buttons on the front. So, um, so there's a little web page that you can you can configure these as well. Um, anyway, it's just a great little great little converter box if you're a production person. Uh, you should put one of these in your crikey kit. So we buy you know. HDMI converters because we convert the HDMI out of the cam cameras that we use. That's right. all they have for output to the SDI, which is serial digital interface that our TriCaster uses. But they're pretty much one-way, one-use devices. This this is the same idea, but it would go in both ways and could do scaling and all sorts of other stuff. Yeah, and and, and sometimes you can find less expensive ways to go from HDMI to oh, SDI, nice. for instance, that are only one way. But still, at three hundred dollars, this is a pretty good deal as far as all the things that it can do. Yeah. Um, you know, to get things in and out, and uh, and so it's anyway. We we pack them with all kinds of stuff. It's it's very powerful little box. Very cute, and it's cool looking, and it's got a great name, the decimate from Decimator Design. <laughs> and they, and they make lots of great things, but this is the one that we probably use the most. Nice MDHX for two ninety five. Andy and Ako, pick of the week, sir. Uh, coolest thing ever. It's uh, the W3 uh, Apple Watch stand by Elago. Uh, it is a silicone molded uh, model of a classic Macintosh that you fit <gasps> your uh, charging cable <sighs> into. <sighs> and then when, you, when you're charging it, oh, the want. screen of the watch perfectly <sighs> fits the screen of the little Mac. Oh, it's, of course, my. nightstand mode. So basically, so you have this God. tiny, tiny, tiny little like Mac 128 that's showing you the time and the date while you're charging. Fourteen damn dollars! Oh That's my like, God, is this cool? I just want to buy nineteen of them just to uh, just to reflect how happy I am that they're making this, and it's and it's so good. What I thought that was kind of cool when I first saw it, and then like, oh my God. The, not only is there a three and a half inch disc slot, the disc slot has a manual eject hole for a bent paper clip. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> I'm like, Mr. or Mrs. or Ms. Elago, I need to bake you a bunt cake or something. That is brilliant. This is pretty <laughs> awesome. Uh, but it's in black, or can I get it in, in uh, beige yeah. and apple? No, it's it's in. You, I think you should get it in beige. It's in yeah. beige or black. The okay. rest of their stands look really nice too. But oh my goodness, you just have to get this. Oh, it's so cool. I, oh. I would t I would take. I'm gonna take my watch out of my drawer, just using it exclusively as a nightstand clock, <laughs> just to use this thing. I've got like two of them on order. Yeah, brilliant. Renee Ritchie. Pick of the week, sir. So mine is a, a, a little bit more expensive than the awesome, awesome Macintosh Apple Watch, Dan. It is the LG Ultrafine 5K display. I picked one up over the Ooh, holidays. I'm so um, jealous. Because Apple didn't make, they did not make a 5K display. You can get a 5K iMac with a P3 color profile, but you cannot get a standalone display. Instead, they punted to LG. Now, they did a lot of the engineering work with LG so that it's all powered by one cable. You have a Thunderbolt 3 cable that goes from the Mac to the LG display, and that provides power and all the bandwidth you need for 5K to get the image from your MacBook. A 13-inch MacBook can drive one of these. 15-inch MacBook can drive two of them. So you could have five 2K, sorry, two 5K displays, one sitting on either side of a 15-inch MacBook Pro, which I tried and is stupefyingly beautiful. Um, the only problem is it doesn't leave a lot of bandwidth left for anything else. So the only other port you get on it is three times USB-C, which uh, with a five gigabit per second maximum. So it's not a powerhouse in terms of a hub, but you can still use your MacBook hubs if that's what you want to do, like the hubs on the actual MacBook Pro itself. Uh, it's utilitarian in design. It is neither Apple's A-game nor LG's A-game when it comes to design. And that bothers me because it's what I look at all the time. And I'm used to looking at a Thunderbolt or an iMac display. Uh, and LG makes beautiful uh, televisions and some beautiful displays. So I'm kind of cheesed off that for this, this, which is supposed to be a flagship display. It doesn't have that sort of sense of design, but it works once the screen is on, you sort of ignore everything else about it. It's not as glossy as an Apple display, which some people really like, but I find because I have the MacBook open and I'm using both screens, the difference a little bit bothers me, especially seen from an angle. It just seems a little bit more muted on yeah, the LG displays. I like the glossy actually, yeah. Yeah, but the color profile is fantastic. It, it is, some people have complained that they've had to recalibrate them, but mine both came identical. And as far as I can tell, they're identical to my iMac and to my MacBook Pro. Uh, and just the reds are gorgeous. The greens are so beautiful, are deep. Uh, the purples and the oranges, they're fantastic looking. Uh, I set them up. I tried both on, on one computer at first. Now I've got one here in front of me and I've got one in my office 
it's not my office, sorry, my living room. So I can just take the MacBook from one, plug it into the other and, and keep working. And it's like having two, basically two workstations that I can easily move the same computer between. So I, I really am sad that it doesn't have the level of design that I'm used to, especially if I'm paying, like if there's anything that you can do with, like you can charge Apple customers a premium for a display and they will pay it. Like if there's one place you can get away with it, it's doing it here and they didn't do it. So I'm disappointed with that. Uh, but functionality wise, it's a, it's a good display. Good. Well, I can live with that. I'd like it to look nice, but I mean, I can, as long as the image quality is good. Yeah, image quality is very good. And Renee recommends some downloadable wallpaper for your new 5K display or not, or for your iPad or your iPhone. I love this. This is to celebrate Chinese New Year's or Nian Hua. Uh, yep. And they're beautiful wallpapers from artists done on, I, I presume, done on uh, Apple products, right? I believe so. Yeah, yeah I mean, if it, it's early. It was funny. If, if you go to iMessage right now and you type in Happy Chinese New Year, you'll get the celebration animation, a red bubble with a gold writing in it. Oh, so, it's early, but Apple's all in on uh yeah, it's on not until next month, right? right? Yeah, I think it's 18 days from now. Okay. I mean, you can start saying Gangshi Fatsai, but you know, it'll be a little bit early. So if I go into messages and I send a message that says, what, Happy Chinese Happy New Year? Happy Chinese New Year, yeah. Oh, I got to try that. Happy. And I don't have to do anything else. It will automatically no. do it? Yeah. I don't have to heart, long press it or anything. Happy no. Chinese New Year. I'm sending this to my mother. Okay, let's see. Could you have the over-the-shoulder shot? Because I really want to see this. Here we go. Uh, let me do it uh, to my mother. Oh, look, fireworks. Oh, yes. I love and that. Red is pros uh, yellow is prosperity and red is luck. So, got, so it has the colors. For oh, New well. nice. And then you can also get this beautiful yep. wallpaper. Does is this? Does Apple? I've never seen Apple do downloadable wallpaper before. They they do downloadable no. wallpaper. And they've done things before, like they have they have special bags in Japan, and they do do things for Chinese New Year because it's such a huge market for them. But I think they're starting to do even more things along that that, that type. Oh, now. I hope they do it for other markets too. I love this. Yep. Um, you know, wallpaper is is one of the things that's really great. And this they have. Uh, I guess this will work on iPad as well and iPhone as well. Yeah. Um, I mean, they did the Thanksgiving challenge for North America on the Apple Watch, so they are trying. And they did a, a New Year's challenge for everybody around okay. the world. If you if you if you fill up your rings every day for a full week, uh, Monday to Sunday, I believe it is, you'll get a special award for the new year uh, from Apple Watch. So they're trying to do things that uh, are both sort of fun, but have some value for people. Nice. Uh, Google Apple Made in CNY. Uh, made in CNY, and you can find their uh, special page at apple.com. It's a, it's from the Hong Kong uh, apple.com yeah. site. And there's some really beautiful uh, images, even if... You're not celebrating Chinese New Year. They're they're really great. I love the fish. That's nice. Yeah. Fortune flows. Ladies and gentlemen, the time has come to say goodbye to all the family. Rene Ritchie, who's a chief masketeer at Mobile Nations. He's also a regular at iMore.com and on his own iMore podcast, including Apple Talk. You'll find that at iMore.com. Uh, as well thank you Renee. oh and we finally we had a long delay because of some issues but we finally published the last for now debug episode which has oh. uh, leah napolitana who used to be experience lead for siri so she did everything from how the, the verbosity of siri on carplay versus television versus phone and linda dong who worked on the apple pencil project was doing prototyping for that and it's a fascinating wow uh, insight into those you get some good people Try. awesome just go to imore.com and in the left hand menu check podcasts and that'll pull you yeah. up the uh, podcast page from iMore and some lot of good stuff. Andy Anako at the Chicago Sun Times. Hello. What's your favorite diner? Oh, whichever one is open after two p.m. <laughs> because it's a bit of a struggle to. Get, all, all, all the diners are breakfast and lunch, and the ones that stay open until four tend to go out of business. But yeah, that's okay. Although I will say that if you're in Boston, there is a 24-hour diner like two blocks away from uh, uh, from South Station, the main like oh. train station hub. Oh. And so there, many has been the time where I've thought that you know my train is coming. It's at 7:10, or I could have like dinner at the diner that has those really nice like uh, casserole blueberry pies at the Ooh. end, and take the 10:20 p.m. train, <laughs> and I will take the 10:20. Take the 10:20. Uh, you can find his work at the Chicago Sun Times, and of course on the website cwob.com. He's I H N A T K O on the Twitter, 
and he's Andy I on the Flickr. I'm also an Otco on Instagram. So. Oh, Instagram too, yeah. Great pictures on Instagram. Thanks so much uh, to Alex Lindsay, who will be traveling abroad soon. Yes, I got a couple of weeks of bouncing around uh, the world, a little in Europe, a little Southeast Asia. So, uh, nice. But I'm going to try to get a hotel at both of those locations oh. that, um, that I can that I can get to. So That'd be we'll, fun uh, to have you on. All right. Yeah. So it's, I'm going from very cold to very hot. So we'll, we'll look for we'll you. See how that, <laughs> so I might be a little sniffly. It's very <laughs> hot. At, I, at Alex Lindsay on Twitter, L I N D S A Y. Right. And by and by the way, we I uh, tried something this morning before the show uh, called a Pixelcore text session. Uh, if you if you go up to Twitter, you'll see links to it um, if, uh, in my Twitter account. And uh, I thought it went pretty well. We were just talking about audio technology. Um, so uh, we had uh, Brian Maddox, who's one of our our top uh, audio engineers, as well as John Tatulis from Sound Devices, um, just talking geekery uh, and answering questions. Um, so uh, it's it's on Hazu. Probably the easiest way to find that is. Uh, is through uh, through Twitter. So um, you know, as far as the full URL, but um, but anyway, but you might want to check it out and see if uh, if you like it. Uh, but we're gonna do. I think we're gonna do more of those this year. It's kind of an experiment. Nice, really cool. Is it so? It's video. Uh... It's video. Yeah. So it's it's. Uh, we're trying to figure out what to do with it. It's it's one of those things that uh, you know the idea is to get. Uh, it's it's really going to be production oriented, um, and uh, and so it's it's really geek you know geeky in this case we're talking about audio the next one might be 360 or live switching or you know things that we think that we're interested in <laughs> things that we think that we're interested in talking around right. media tech yeah. um and but it's just kind of an open discussion and because it's sitting on hazu it you know people can ask questions and vote them up and down and we can uh we, we just kind of let the questions drive the it's not it's it's really not that structured uh we talk about a couple things we want to talk about and then for the most part 90 percent of it is just answering people's questions really cool and Hazu is your is your thing, right? Yes. Yeah. So it's a little it's nicely it's, um, done. I like that. It's gotten a little. Uh, it's it's gotten a little more slick. refined. Yes. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very it's slick. Working well. Yeah. yeah. The little chat function. And and YouTube some, in uh, bed uh, up top and. Yeah. So it's uh, it's, it's it's gotten it's it's growing. I like this. It's getting better. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Thanks to all of you for joining us. We do Mac Break Weekly on uh, Tuesdays, 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern, 2100 UTC. If you want to stop by, say hi. You can also join us in the studio. Just email tickets at twit.tv. Wait till the rain stops. Because otherwise, <laughs> no, you don't know. Two of the three ways to get here were closed. Uh, uh, and the last way Sunday. is a boat. The last way, I still had to go buy a closed sign and fort it in my Tesla. I put the <laughs> suspension on high. So romantic, isn't it? Yeah. Ooh. Like the Lotus. It went to submarine mode and you made it through. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> that was Sunday. It's, uh, it's raining today, too, and I think we're going to have more flooding. So. Um, if you can't be here in person or watch live on the stream, don't worry. On-demand audio and video of everything we do is available after the fact at twit.tv. In this case, twit.tv slash mbw for Mac Break Weekly. Or you could subscribe. We have uh, uh, lots of ways to watch on uh, Apple TV, on uh, iOS, on Android, everywhere. Roku. Actually, now that we're on YouTube Live at uh, youtube.com slash twit, you can watch the live stream and uh, watch the individual episodes for any show there. Uh, that makes it available on a lot of platforms because almost everything has a YouTube app. So another way to watch live. Now, when when are you going to 4K, Leo? Now yeah. you have. Now you're going to. We did. We yeah. did our first. We did our first public 4 4K stream with uh, uh, Natalie Dawn. You know from Pomplinus. Oh, I love her. And if you go to Natalie Dawn, she's one of the, the few channel. people who would actually look good in 4K. She does. Yeah. Yeah. It's it was where is good. it? We, we What's did, the URL? It's on Natalie Dawn's channel in YouTube, and it's a uh, uh, and it is a it's our first. We've done lots of testing in 4K, but this is our first public uh, 4K stream. So yeah. it was. I remember. You know, the nice thing is, um, oh look at that! This is great. The nice thing is, um, thanks to uh, YouTube, people can watch 4K. Back when it was uh, 1080p and you didn't have YouTube, it was we challenged people considerably. When we started doing this kind of stuff, but now you can do it, uh, and and people will see it at whatever scale or resolution they are capable of. It does look good. What did you shoot this with? Uh, we shot those with um, those are Black Magic. Uh, oh, uh, Black Magic um, uh, Mini Ursas, four point sixes, and then we had uh, PL uh, lenses on them, the Canon um, Canon seventeen to one twenties. Those are you know big. Big lenses. <laughs> this is nice. And, uh, this is really they, nice. Yeah, they did kind of like a little Q&A, um, and they played, I think, five or six songs. And um, the, 
I mean, everything came out, um, we thought, really well. So um, so it's definitely, uh, but if you want to see some some f- live live stream 4K, it's... That's amazing. This is, uh, this is HBO quality. Really looks good. Yeah, we played pretty hard on it. And we were really yeah. excited that they let us, uh, that we took over uh, the, the lunchroom at uh, Patreon. Oh, nice. <laughs> so. Where her husband, Jack Conti, is the founder. So he, yeah. she has an in there. Yeah. And so it gave us a space to work on Nice. Out. That's on uh, YouTube's uh, Natalie Dawn channel. N-A-T-A-L-Y Dawn. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. But you better get back to work now because you know what? Break time is over. Bye-bye.